I want every white person in this room who would be happy to be treated as this society in general treats our citizens, our black citizens. If you, as a white person, would be happy to receive the same treatment that our black citizens do in this society, please stand. You didn't understand the directions. If you white folks want to be treated the way blacks are in this society, stand. Nobody's standing here. That says very plainly that you know what's happening. You know you don't want it for you. I want to know why you're so willing to accept it or to allow it to happen for others. <laughs> Because the only time that people say all lives matter is in opposition to Black Lives Matter. Nor will I ever sacrifice my skin for the white man's status. Anybody ever expects me to do anything but be myself that got me fucked up. They try to take us out. So I ain't stepping out the car to hold. They only got the power because we don't know who we are no more. Look at us as targets, bro. Make them shit the charges for me and call a savage when we find the else you're on Abuse of your authority. Your sergeant just ignore me. Put your phone down. Come help and stop reporting me. Fuck your brotherhood, clanhood. Brother, you messed up the flow, man. Hold on. Your sorority. How long you been extorting me? Now I'm robbing Lori G. Blue Lives Matter got me laughing. That shit comical. You proud, say it loud. Drop it near me. What's phenomenal? Let these bitches know we get more ignorant than designer do. We gods in the flesh. More intelligence than chronicles. Real life freedom costs you lesser than Obama phones. If you fail to see it, then you sleep with no pajamas on. Let them know the time has come. Now we on with Malcolm on. It's cool when you was out for home, but now we get you out the zone. You get you out your home, man. You see reality, make you see what is, what it was, and what it had to be. You kill my mother's brother, then show your badge to me. I told you that I'm innocent, and you just laughed at me. Shooting niggas off the jump like you practicing. That's what we mean by Black Lives Mattering. Seek to triumph, you make a left a tragedy. We about to see the bigger picture, God's masterpiece.
call for calmness, call for order. I say yes, but it's not the, the absence of tension. It's got to be the presence of that justice and accountability and that fairness. I, I, when I hear the authorities, even President Obama, says, well, the attack on the police is an attack on all of us. I said, okay, but an attack on black people, especially black youth, is also an attack on all of us. If, in fact, the attack on the police is an assault on all of us, then when the police unfairly maims and murders civilians, the police is killing on behalf of all of us. Well, I don't want the police kill on behalf of me. I want the police to be treated with respect and fairly. And I want black youth and brown youth, black men and black women to be treated fairly. Thing they ever wrote. Don't like to regurgitate, so that means I'll never choke. And never bite my tongue, cast my uncounted vote. Then broke the chains of the mental noose around my throat. So let me talk about these religious folks. Join around in the business, whole congregation be broke. Claiming that you'll be blessed if you just touch on their own. Be it and taking everything from you like Satan did Job. So the crime is hiding, praying in the battalion. The same was laying their hands, just ties and monopolizing. They say they preaching the truth. We at they hide behind lies. They say they do this for Christ, but they just mix in the sky. They tell you come as you are, but when you come as you are, instead of embracing you and lovely, you will just be the stuff. But I ain't got no mind off, but I experience the most. You go to church to see God, but they get not even close. The streets are gray and the solid, you and the feeling the most. And it's the sad, sad world. Can't congregate for church folks. But I ain't tripping over none of that. I know that God loves me, and at the end of the day, only God can judge me. First Amendment, 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 First Amendment. First Amendment, first Amendment. I don't blame it, never respect How I don't tell vision and parents raising the ratchet kids with no supervision instead of raising the men. We raising up little niggas just because you kill your brother. Don't make your brother grow no bigger. And then this precious little girl growing up with no purpose. Instead of raising the women, they baby mamas and twerkers. No boys and prostitutes to sit in nine to five work. Materialistic parents like the school, they can't even focus. Brainwashed on the firewall. Walking dead, no substance. Still popping weed, head, headed for self destruction. So let's talk to our youth, show them positive things. So rise up and can you throw my young kings and queens? First Amendment, 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 First Amendment. First Amendment, First Amendment, First Amendment, First Amendment, First Amendment, I don't know, 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 I don't know. All right, all right, let me cut my camera on. Usually I will begin my broadcast with saying, Peace. I would use some form of peace. I would say hotep or alafia or amani or some word uh, that means peace in um, one of our traditional African tongues. But right now, I don't feel so peaceful. Um, you know, I really want to greet you saying abibi fahode, which means African liberation or harambe, let's pull together. But I'm not in a peaceful mood. Um, just yesterday, I was informed that our brother Rakim Kafri was snatched up by the feds uh, the beginning of December of 2017. So just a month ago or two months ago, this brother's home was raided. Uh, he was labeled a, a black a BIE. And uh, they said he's been under surveillance uh, since 2015 because he was participating in a lot of different rallies against police brutality. And so they've been watching him since 2015. 
And then they labeled him as a BIE. And for those who don't know what a BIE is, it is a black uh, identity extremist. So he was labeled as a BIE, which uh, gave them uh, uh, legal permission, you know, uh, to uh, to um, to put surveillance on the brother. And um, so they watched him for about two years and then they um, they raided his home in December. They found, I believe, two guns. I was told that he um, they brought him out in his underwear, had him outside standing in his underwear for a few hours. Uh, raided his home, uh, found two guns, and they say, well, he wasn't supposed to have the guns uh, because of an assault charge that he had back in 2007. But the probable cause to enter his home was because he had been labeled as a black identity extremist. And so they had him outside in his underwear for a few hours, and um, they ransacked his home. They they located two guns, and they said, oh, you know, he He's holding illegal firearms because he, you know, he had a, a misdemeanor. Um, he got a misdemeanor when he was in Texas at, at, at one point. And so they locked them up and, and they haven't allowed him to be bailed out. Uh, the family is trying to raise $20,000. So they're asking a thousand people to raise $20, um, which I think is doable. Um, and before I even continue, shout out to brother Kofi Posse of Kofi Posse TV. Uh, pleasure to have you on the panel, brother. I know that this was uh, sort of an impromptu um, Google Hangout, but um, you know my platform isn't very large. But I wanted to use what I could to bring awareness to this brother's um, situation. I'm also going to contact Brother Sinetta today. I'm going to contact Dr. Boyce Watkins. I'm also going to reach out to Brother Tariq Nasheed and also Dr. Umar Johnson because this is things that we need to talk about. And even if there's a sister who has a big platform. Uh, sister Yvette, I want to say her name is Yvette Carnell, but these are brothers and sisters who have uh, a huge platforms and we need to be using these platforms to support each other, to promote uh, our products and to also assist uh, with times of need. And this is a time of need. This is a brother who is out there fighting for black liberation. And as a result of protesting police brutality, as a result of co-founding, he's the, I don't know brothers and sisters know, but he's the co-founder of the Huey, P, the Huey P. Newton Gun Club. He founded this gun club, which is very, very popular. A lot of brothers and sisters joined this, this, this gun club and they've been traveling around to different places where there have been incidents of police brutality. And so he also co-founded the, the Huey P. Newton uh, Gun Club. And so, um, <laughs> you know, we need to support those who support us. We need to support brothers and sisters who are fighting for black liberation. And we don't do that. So I understand why black folks say, I don't want to be a black leader because look how we treat our leaders. Look how we treat our fighters. I think I'm going to go to this, the GoFundMe live and I'm going to donate live on air so you guys can see that I'm not just asking you to donate 20, 30, 40, 50, or hundred dollars, whatever you can afford. I don't want to just tell you to donate. I want to show you that I'm also uh, don donating as well. And his GoFundMe should have well over twenty thousand dollars okay i mean look at george zimmerman as soon as he got arrested for killing trayvon martin i think within 24 hours he had over a hundred thousand dollars sitting in the gofundme so surely black people we can round up twenty thousand dollars for brother kareem caffrey's legal fund especially a brother that is out here on the battlefield fighting for the liberation of black people you know you got a lot of men i ain't gonna say men i'm gonna call them males because i use that word men very, uh, very uh, carefully. There are a lot of males who sit back at home. Peace, of brother. Not in the black world or the brother. Mute your mic for me because I hear an echo. Okay, I got it. All right, thank you very much, brother. But uh, there are a lot of brothers who um, there are a lot of brothers uh, who kind of, and I'm not. This is no diss to my brothers. I love my black men, and I want you to understand that I love black men, black men. But there are a lot of black males who have yet to evolve into black men and to understand that their responsibilities is to protect and provide for their family communities and all that they survey, okay? This brother stood up, okay? This brother stood up, all right? In the midst of the different police brutality incidents, this brother stood up, he, he co-founded a gun club 
to teach black people how to shoot guns. He went around and, and, and taught. So he is a teacher. He is a defender. He is a father. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? You got my, most brothers and sisters, when people get shot, they watch it on TV, they watch it on the internet, they sit back and they go about their ways. They keep on working their jobs. They go to church, they go to the mosque, they do whatever, but they're not active in our community. And they're not standing up and defending black males, females and children. And this was a brother who stood up. So I think that the least we can do, the least we can do is to donate to his GoFundMe, right? To make sure that this brother has uh, 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 financial support for uh, his 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 lawyer, and to also ensure that his family. This brother has three children. Matter of fact, let me bring up his Facebook page while I'm talking about him, because I'm really bothered right now, brothers and sisters. And I know you're probably like, "Dr. Midas, she's going off. She's a little upset." Yes, I am. I'm absolutely upset, and I'm hurt right now. I'm hurt. I'm angry, and I'm frustrated. Let me share my screen with you so you can see what I see, brothers and sisters. All right. Let me go to his Facebook page. I'm actually supposed to be getting in touch with his family today. A close friend of the family reached out to me and said they're going to put me directly in touch with this brother. All right. I'm not his friend on Facebook, but we can go through a few of his profile pics, which are public. So this is the brother, brother Kareem Caffrey. And I don't even want to keep calling him a brother. I'm going to call him a warrior on the battlefield, boots on the ground. Look at him. Look at our brother out there and these other brothers out there. So when 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 Trayvon Martin, Michael Brown, uh, Alton Sterling, Philando Castillo, when these brothers were getting murdered by the police, these brothers, galvan they galvanized, they mobilized, they got together, they learned how to shoot guns, they got weapons, they encouraged other brothers and sisters to arm themselves. And they went out here and did something. Most of y'all just sat in the house when it happened, you hashtagged it, you put it on Facebook, you put it on Twitter, and you kept on going about your little life but and screaming black power from your keyboards only because most of y'all are, are black power keyboard people presentation, black power people, but you're not really out here in the community doing anything. This brother's out here. Let me show you some more pictures of this brother's activism. All right, this is when the other brother had murdered the five police officers. I think that's his little son. So this brother's out here, warrior, on a battlefield, protecting, look at this. Training, he was a trainer. Look at this brother. And you can see that he was an African Senate brother. All right. I think that's more of his sons. I think he, I think he has two sons and a daughter. This is the brother. And I'm just flicking through his profile pictures so you can get the general idea of what he stood for. And we can see that he was an African Senate brother who believed in protecting his family and his communities. Teacher. Look at this, RBG. So you already know that he was a, a Garvey Knight. Black nationalism. This is the brother. Family man. African centered. Look at this. He's holding the book Blood in My Eye. Come on now, by George Jackson, Blood in My Eye. This is the brother, a warrior. I wish we had more warriors. Look at him, training, speaking. I'm hurt right now, family. I don't know if you can hear it in my voice or what, but I am hurt right now. Look at this, bringing awareness, using his platform to bring awareness to what's happened. So let me get into it, family. The Atlanta Black Star, they published this article yesterday, article published by David Love, FBI tracks and arrests black identity extremists. 
and hardly anyone is talking about it. So you're saying, Dr. Ma, what the hell is a black identity extremist? I'm not going to read through this entire PDF that I'm showing you, but this was a memo that was released by the feds. Uh, I want to say August of 2017. Yeah. Yep. August the 3rd, 2017. This was the memo. Black identity extremists likely motivated to target law enforcement officers at your leisure, brothers and sisters. And a matter of fact, I'm going to put the link in the chat room so that you can access this document. It's 12 pages. I'm not going to comb through them all. The link is in the chat room right now. All right. I'm not going to comb through all of these pages, but I'm going to read the first page so that you guys can get a gist of what a black identity extremist is. Because I was quite surprised that yesterday when I posted brother Kareem Caffrey's picture and I said he's the first person to be uh, prosecuted under the BIE uh, or the black identity extremist program, a lot of brothers and sisters said, you know, Dr. Ma'at, what is a black identity extremist? And I, and my response to them was, where have you been, you know, the last six months? Are you not paying attention to what's going on in this world? Right? Here we go. Black identity extremists. This is the F, this is coming straight from the FBI. This is their document that I'm getting ready to read. I'm going to read the executive summary so that you can get an idea for those who don't know what a black identity extremist is. The FBI assesses it is very likely black identity extremists, BIE perceptions of police brutality against African-Americans spew, is spewed an increase in premeditated retaliatory, retaliatory eth, uh, uh, lethal violence against law enforcement and will likely serve as justification for such violence. The FBI assess it is very likely this increase began following the nine the August the 9th, 2014 shooting of Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri, in the subsequent grand jury, November 2014, de declination to indict the officers involved. The FBI assesses it is very likely incidents of alleged, I mean, they act like we're just making police brutality up. If you notice, they're using, look at the language that they're using. Everything is alleged. Everything is, you know, more than likely uh, perceptions, right? So they're using very subjective language. If you know, just got to pay attention. The FBI assesses it is very likely incidents of alleged police brutality, of alleged police abuse against African Americans since then have continued to feed the resurgence in ideologically motivated violent criminal activity. Now, it's criminal when we rise up and defend ourselves. Listen to this, violent criminal activity within the BIE movement. The FBI assesses, it is very likely some BIEs are influenced by a mix of anti-authoritarian Moorish sovereign citizen ideology and the BIE ideology. The FBI has high confidence in these assessments based on a history of violent incidents attributed to individuals who acted on behalf of their ideological beliefs documented in FBI investigations in other law enforcement and open source reporting. The FBI makes this judgment with the key assumption the recent incidents are ideologically motivated. Okay. So it says, this is the scope note. And I think this is the last thing that I'm going to read to you all. It says, this intelligent assessment focuses on individuals with BIE ideological motivations who have committed targeted premeditated attacks against law enforcement officers since 2014. Now tell me, family, what political activist group since 2014 went out there and shot and killed police officers? Name one. Now you might name the, the brother. Um, oh my gosh, I had his picture up when I was showing the profile. I believe that that incident happened in Dallas, Texas. I think they say that he murdered three or four police officers. And then it was another incident somewhere in Missouri where the guy killed one or two police officers. 
So we're looking at maybe five or six, right? But there have been more white people who have killed police officers than black people. And I'm going to show you that 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 status, that that uh, that particular statistics, that particular statistics in a few. OK, but there have been more white people who have killed law enforcement officers than blacks. But you see that they don't have a white identity extremist uh, memo out. They produce a black identity extremist. So anyway, it says this assessment does not address BIEs who have attacked law enforcement officers during the course of officers' routine duties, such as responding to calls and traffic stops in which violent actions were reactionary in nature. This assessment addresses the following key intelligence questions. To what extent are BIEs targeting, targeting interests retaliatory? It says, what cross uh, programmatic relationships influence the BIE movement? This assessment is the first FBI analytic intelligence product to assess influences between the sovereign citizen extremist movement and the black identity extremist movement. The FBI has previously reported on BIE retaliatory violence against law enforcement and two products, both of which had findings consistent, consistent with this assessment. The, the 23, they're talking about March 23rd, 2016, FBI intelligence bullet, bulletin titled Black Separatist Extremists Call for Retaliation in Response to Police Involved Incidents Could Incite Acts of Violence Against Law Enforcement. Fa family, I got to definitely uh, get this PDF. I haven't read that one. It says it assessed incidents involving allegations of law enforcement abuse and related legal proceedings would likely lead to BSE calls for violent retaliation and incite these domestic extremists to commit violent acts against law enforcement. The November the 14th, 2014 FBI intelligence bulletin titled Potential Criminal Reactions to Missouri Grand Jury Announcement assessed the announcement of the grand jury's decision to the shooting death of Michael Brown in Ferguson would likely be exploited by some individuals to justify threats and attack against law enforcement and critical infrastructure. So it's like, to me, they're, they're making it seem like the law enforcement are the victims. You get what I'm saying? Hold on. So let me keep on going. Let me look at this yellow box family. So source summary assessment. Uh, ba -ba -ba -ba, I don't know if this is. Yeah, I don't know if this is necessary to read. All right, so it's going into suspect grievances very likely lead to uh, valid, valid targeting of law enforcement. So it's going into several different incidents that have occurred since 2014, okay, and the different rulings um, that occurred. And they're saying that these uh, incidents and rulings have, uh, have influenced uh, brothers and sisters who they are labeling as uh, black identity extremists that is motivating them to attack law enforcement officers, not to protect the black community, but to attack law enforcement officers. Okay. And this is what they're trying to say in this limo. So I, I mean, in this memo. So I put the link in the chat room, please read it uh, whenever you get an opportunity to educate yourself on what a black identity extremist is. Now, when I first heard about this BIE, I automatically thought about the COINTELPRO, okay? The counterintelligence program that was launched in 1956, and it allegedly, I'm going to use their terminology now, it, it allegedly ended in 1971. So this is what I thought about. As soon as I read this memo six months ago, I said, oh my goodness, this is COINTELPRO 2017, you know, uh, just a new, you know, it's like they revived it under a different name. And so for those of you who don't know what COINTELPRO is, just do a quick Google search um, and, and type in the word so you can educate yourself on this program. But it was a program launched by the FBI to take down a lot of political uh, organizations, you know, who were fighting for uh, black liberations. So, it, you know, they were able to, uh, they, they got Marcus Garvey, uh, the uh, Southern, uh, the, Christ the Southern Christian Conference. Uh, they got them, the Black Panther Party. So they used this program 
uh, to justify the illegal tactics that they use to neutralize uh, these black uh, liberation organizations. So I'm gonna read a little bit of this, Pro, so you can understand why, why I made that connection that uh, black identity extremists is nothing but a 2017 COINTELPRO. So COINTELPRO in full counterintelligence program, COINTELPRO program, well, co-intelligence program conducted by the FBI from 1956 to 1971 to discredit and neutralize organizations considered subversive to U.S. political stability. Huh. Not to defend themselves against a government that is attacking them, right? That's what they were doing. But it says they want to discredit and neutralize organisms that were subversive to the U.S. political stability. We have to understand, family, what white folks did, okay? We got to understand how they move and how they operate. And what they did was they came over here, they, they invaded and annexed the land of the Native Americans, and then they set up a government to protect white interests. Your government wasn't designed to protect you. So, you know, when, when folks get upset, when these officers don't get prosecuted and all that, you got to understand that this system, this government was not set up to protect you. This government was set up to protect and to advance white interests, okay? That's what your government was set up to do. And what they do is they create laws, all right, that will maintain the status quo, laws that will protect their interests. Uh, my my uh, book club that I co-founded with Sister Alima Injai, we're reading the book Blueprint for Black Power by Dr. Amos Wilson. And Dr. Amos Wilson said that you got to be careful when you look at these laws and these rules. And he said behind every law, rule, or policy, there's a group that stands to benefit. So you have to question these laws. You have to question these rules. You have to question these policies, okay? And we had to understand that these laws and that the, and the, this governmental body was set up to protect white interests, all right? We also have to understand, and I'm, I'm talking so much that I got so much going on in my mind, I'm trying to think about what the next thing I wanted to say, but that was the purpose of your government, all right? to maintain status quo, to generate laws, to protect white interests. So anyway, this was a program that was set up, again, it says, to, to maintain U.S. political stability. It was covert and often used extra legal means to criminalize various forms of political struggle and derail several social movements, such as those for civil rights and Puerto Rico, Puerto, I'm sorry, Puerto Rican independence. COINTELPRO operations were initiated against various organizations, including the Communist Party, Socialist Workers Party, Puerto Rican Nationalist Party, the Black Panther Party, the American Indian Movement, Southern Christian Leadership Conference, and Ku Klux Klan. Tactics included intense surveillance, organizational infiltration, infu infiltration, I'm sorry, family, organizational infiltration, anonymous mailings. This is the stuff that they were doing and police harassment. These programs were exposed in 1971 when the Citizens Commission, when the Citizens Commission to investigate the FBI burglarized an FBI office in Media, Pennsylvania, stole confidential files and then released them to the press. More information regarding COINTELPRO was later obtained through the Freedom of Information Act. Lawsuits lodged, lodged against the FBI by the BPP and the SWP and statements by agents who came forward to confess their counterintelligence activities. Then it goes on to say, family, that a major investigation was launched in 1975 by the U.S. Senate Select Committee to study governmental uh, operations with respect to intelligence activities, commonly referred to as Church Committee for its chairman, Senator Frank Church of Idaho. However, millions of pages of documents remain unreleased and many released documents are heavily censored. In its final report, the committee sharply criticized COINTELPRO. All right, so this came straight from the Encyclopedia Britannica, but again, you can Google COINTELPRO. Uh, thousands of links, links will populate so that you can educate yourself on this program and how it was used to neutralize uh, our black liberation organizations. 
All right, so let's get to this right now, family. Our brother, brother Rakeem Caffrey, uh, he's been uh, labeled, he was labeled a BIE, and there are a lot of brothers and sisters who are labeled BIEs, but he's the first person to get uh, prosecuted um, under this uh, program that was launched in August of 2017. So they've been following this brother since 2015, and um, and they finally kicked in his door, you know, raided his home, uh, uh, used the excuse to, hey, you know, you're, you're a BIE, that's why we've been watching you, you know, and that's why we had uh, probable cause to come into your home, take your guns, have you outside in your underwear for an hour, right? And they had this man sitting in a, a federal facility right now uh, with no bail. So it says FBI tracks and arrests black identity extremists. And let me put this in a link, family. I'm gonna put this in the chat room. Getting ready to put this in the chat room right now. For brothers and sisters to have the link. All right, so this article came out yesterday and I saw a lot of brothers and sisters sharing on Facebook, but family, we need to be doing more than just sharing on Facebook. I mean, what have we come to black people? Has anyone reached out to the family? Is anyone donating? Are we mobilizing to go to this brother's hearing? These are the things that we need to be talking about and doing. It's too much talking. I think brothers and sisters are getting too comfortable with YouTube, too comfortable on social media. So we sit back, we share things, we hashtag it, and then we go about our merry lives. And we need to be doing more than that. We need to be talking and we need to be sharing this information, bringing awareness to the situation, and also doing, mobilizing, going to this brother's court hearing, sending him letters to let this brother know. And I'm going to get his address today. I'm going to get his information today. And I'm going to post it on my Facebook page for those who don't know what my Facebook page is. It is under my legal name, Deanna Bailey, because Facebook has removed two of my pages. Um, they've shut me down a few times on Facebook. It seems like every time I accumulate a huge following, uh, I end up they end up shutting my page down or they ask me for my identity. And as soon as I give them my identity, they still uh, they still won't put my page back up. And so uh, my page now is just De Deanna Bailey, D-E-A-N-N-A-B-A-I-L-E-Y. So uh, friend request me. If you can't friend request me, just shoot me a follow, okay? And I'm going to post, when I get this brother's information and where he is, I'm going to post it so that brothers and sisters can send him mail so that we can put money on his commissary to make sure that he's okay so that we, you know, we need to be giving him money for his lawyer, send money to his family. He has three children that he cannot provide for while he's behind bars, right? This is a brother that was fighting for us. So the least we can do is make sure that we look out for him in his time of need. So anyway, FBI tracks and arrests black identity extremists and hardly anyone is talking about it. This article is found on atlantablackstar.com. It was, it was written by David Love and it was published yesterday. And this is a picture, uh, I think the last picture that someone posted on February the 4th uh, on his Facebook page. All right, and you see the brother is representing, representing, anyway. It says six months after the FBI issued a report inventing from inventing from whole cloth the term black identity extremists claiming this group poses a terrorist threat to police. The first apparent case of the prosecution of a BIE has emerged. The BIE designation has created concern in the black community that the FBI is launching a new COINTELPRO program targeting black activists who have committed no crimes. So this brother didn't commit a crime. He didn't shoot a police officer, right? He didn't commit any crime, okay? It says with more arrest and prosecution of those involved in racial justice movements to follow. This latest chapter represents the FBI that has been familiar to black people for decades. While the Bureau only recently created the term black identity extremists, its methods, tactics, and orientation remain the same with regard to black activists. The FBI has a long tradition of treating black political movements as terrorists and enemies of the state and a threat to national security and public safety. A conservative white male dominated organization, the FBI always has taken its cues from anti-black right wing propagandists. On December the 12th, 2017, 
in Dallas, Christopher Daniels, also known as Rakeem Balagon, I know on his Facebook page it says Rakeem Caffrey, it says was arrested during a raid on his home and charged with the unlawful possession of a firearm, the result of more than two years of FBI surveillance as foreign policy reported. FBI agents held Daniels outside in his underwear and seized two firearms the government claims he is barred from owning due to a 2007 misdemeanor. This wasn't a felony family, a 2007 misdemeanor domestic assault conviction in Tennessee. Among other items FBI agents took from Daniels' home was a copy of the book, Negroes with Guns, by civil rights activist Robert F. Williams. So they look at, you know, they, 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 were, they were trying to <laughs> determine this brother's ideology and they wanted, they're going to use all this evidence, his guns, the different things that he read to prove that he was what they labeled or classified him as black identity extremist. So look at this, Robert Williams. Williams was the first black leader of his era to support armed resistance to racial oppression. Following the Supreme Court's 1954 Brown versus Board of Education decision, Williams had revived the Monroe, North Carolina chapter of the NAACP amid Ku Klux Klan violence. In response to assaults on black women that were ignored by police, he organized, now look at this, in response to assaults on black women, you got Sandra Bland, you have uh, the young sister Ayana that got shot up by the police, and you got brothers and sisters who did organize it and mobilize but you got a lot of brothers and sisters who just shared the post and kept it moving. This brother organized black workers and veterans, filed for a chapter from the NRA and formed a black armed guard. The group repelled Klan violence against integration and protected the freedom riders. Williams also internationalized the black struggle as he and his family lived in Cuba, where he wrote his book and produced Radio Free Dixie in China for a number of years. Now, this is a quote from him. He said, I advocated violent self-defense because I don't think, I don't really think you can have a defense against violent races and against terrorists unless you are prepared to meet violence with violence. And my policy was to meet violence with violence, said Williams, a forefather of the Black Power Movement and the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense. And I know some of y'all who are listening to this never even heard of uh, brother, uh, I want to say his name is Robert Williams. I haven't heard of brother uh, Robert F. Williams prior to reading this article, but I do plan on purchasing his material. It says the Huey P. Newton Gun Club, a pro open carry group of which Daniels is a founder. So this brother right here, brother uh, Rakeem Caffrey founded the Huey P. Newton Gun Club. Um, this gun club, I mean, they've been making noise. I mean, I heard, I believe that they have uh, two chapters um, I have to talk to Sister Empress Segment to find out all the details, but they have a few gun clubs in different areas where they're training brothers, you know, on brothers and sisters on how to shoot guns, you know, how to shoot them, how to clean them, how to utilize them, you know. And um, and so anyway, he was a co-founder of the Huey P. Newton Gun Club. So, you know, the FBI started looking at him once he founded this gun club. But anyway, it says that the owner that the Huey P. Newton Gun Club a pro open carry group of which Daniels is the founder tweeted that black political activists are being criminalized, which they are. So this was one of his tweets right here. He says black, black activists are under surveillance by the FBI from Dallas to Detroit to South Carolina. Our political activity, even when conducted within the law is being criminalized. And he was hundred percent correct. So he ended up tweeting this a while ago. But it says, according to foreign policy, the FBI became interested in Daniels in 2015 from a video of him participating in a police brutality protest. He wasn't he wasn't ramsacking stores. It's not a video of him ramsacking stores or shooting at police. He was literally participating in a police brutality protest. Right. And that's when they became interested in him. It says which was posted on a right wing conspiracy theory website called InfoWars. Alex Jones, the Austin, Texas-based radio and TV show host who runs InfoWars, is a valuable asset to the Trump administration. Trump uses the conspiracy theorist as a news source, repeat, reportedly called Jones three times in recent months, and has praised Jones in his amazing reputation. 
Jones has claimed that Sandy Hook Elementary School mass shooting in the Boston Marathon bombing were inside jobs and hoaxes, that President Obama was not born in the United States, and the government is making people gay. Jones was the source of Trump's claim that millions of people voted illegally in the 2016 election. He says, quote, I talked to the CIA, FBI connections, Army intelligence connections, former technical head of the NSA, and a bunch of other people that talked to the president, said Jones on his TV program. I'm going to leave it at that. FBI surveillance of Daniels and other activists extended to Detroit and South Carolina. The FBI claims that Daniels openly and publicly advocates violence towards law enforcement on his Facebook profile. Okay, so let me get this right. Let me get this right. Let me get this straight, brothers and sisters. So they became interested in this brother because a video surfaced of him participating, participating in a protest against police brutality. And they looked at his Facebook page. So this is why they watched him for two years. And then also, I'm pretty sure they became aware that he co-founded this Huey P. Newton Gun Club. And this is why they, this was the probable cause that they used to run up in this, this man house. Okay. So it says FBI surveillance of Daniels and other activists extended to Detroit and South Carolina. The FBI claims Daniels openly and publicly advocates violence towards law enforcement on his Facebook profile and posted words of admiration for Micah Johnson, who killed five dollars police officers in 2016. Who did not did the same damn thing. It says in Trey and Trey Man Wilborn, who was accused of killing a cop in Memphis, Tennessee. That the FBI learned of Daniels through the right wing propaganda outlet, such as InfoWars, is instructive, demonstrating that the Bureau is politicized, but not in the manner in which Trump and his supporters believe it is. Trump loyalists, such as uh, Representative Devin Nooms, attacked the FBI for its alleged surveillance abuses in Russia in the Russia in investigation only because the agency poses a danger to an authoritarian president who disrespects the rule of law and the system of checks and balances and is concerned with little more than his open than his own power and ego rather the FBI is responding to pressure from right monitoring two years of black activists within an 11 year old misdemeanor conviction to prosecute him for a federal gun charge this targeting of daniels reflects the inherent racial biases of the fbi organizational culture a culture that also finds virtually all shootings by federal agents justify and classifies all victims of justified homicide by police officers as felons if con if convicted daniels could face up to 10 years in prison they go on to say that in August 2017, the FBI published an intelligence report called I beseech all of you to read this report. It says in the report, the FBI said it is likely black identity extremist perceptions. Again, this is just perceptions of police brutality, not that it's really happening. These are our perceptions, right? Against African-Americans spirit an increase in premeditated retaliatory lethal violence against law enforcement and will very likely serve as justification for such violence. The report claims this increase is ideologically motivated, right? This increase in ideologically motivated incidents began with the 2014 shooting of Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri, and the subsequent failure of a grand jury to indict the police officers responsible responsible for his death, the FBI assesses it is very likely it is very likely incidents of alleged police everything is alleged alleged police abuse against African Americans since then have continued to feed the resurgence in ideologically motivated violent criminal activity within the BIE movement. The FBI assesses, put your mic on me, whoever just came in, I can't see you because I'm reading. The FBI assesses, it is very likely some BIEs are influenced by a mix of anti-authoritarian, Moorish, sovereign, citizen ideology and BIEology, BIE ideology. Black leaders, lawmakers and activists have expressed concern 
over the new BIE designation and according to the Center for Democracy and Technology, civil rights and civil liberties advocates have accused the FBI of taking several distinct incidents and poorly manufacturing a movement from them. In November, the Congressional Black Caucus met with the FBI Director Christopher Wray, concerned about the Bureau's troubling history of targeting Black organizations and that Black activists such as Black Lives Matter will only be criminalized and branded as terrorists and extremists for, protect, for protesting against police brutality. And that's what they've always done, family. What they do is they criminalize things to give, they'll criminalize these organizations or these individuals to justify why they are arresting them, okay? They'll criminalize you or brand you as a terrorist or an extremist, you know, in order to legally prosecute you. Again, we had to understand that we're dealing with a system, we're dealing with a government that was set up to protect white interests and to maintain status quo. The faster you understand this, the faster you'll understand why nobody gets prosecuted for killing black people. Representative Cedric L. Richmond, the Congressional Black Caucus Chairman, fears BIE is the new FBI version of COINTELPRO, referring to the referring to the program under J. Edgar Hoover, designed to prevent the rise. This is what J. Edgar Hoover said: to prevent the rise of a Messiah who could unify and electrify the militant black national black nationalist movement. This is what J. Edgar Hoover said. All right, and monitor, infiltrate and destroy civil rights organizations, all right? Probably some of y'all that's tuned in right now are FBI informant, who knows? Says the history of the federal government coming down on black justice movements as a threat to national security and conflating black activists with domestic terrorists is a long one. Hoover, who targeted black leadership since Marcus Garvey, had his agency send a letter to Martin Luther King urging him to commit suicide. Did you all know this? Because a lot of you black nationalists and black activists, y'all bang on Martin Luther King. You talk about he was soft, not realizing that he shifted his, his ideological paradigm. He, 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 it was a paradigm shift that this brother experienced later on in his life. Many of you aren't aware that he sat down in 1966 with the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and that near his life, he, he regretted integration and he talked about black nationalism, but most of y'all don't know that. So, you know, when you hear Martin Luther King, you think of the 1963, I have I have a dream, Martin Luther King, but don't realize that he evolved in his thinking over the years. You know, we never, as black people, we never give people a chance to evolve in their thinking. You know, we want to keep reminding them what they used to be, what they used to do, instead of looking at who this person is now, right? But anyway, it says that, Hoover had, it says, who targeted the black, blah, blah, blah. He had his agency send a letter to Martin Luther King urging him to commit suicide. And remember, family, I believe that it was in 1997, brothers and sisters in the chat room, correct me if I'm wrong, that the government admitted to uh, assassinating Martin Luther King. It was in 1997. I think you guys can Google that. So they came clean and said, yep, we did it. We were responsible for his assassination. All right. But anyway, says that they, they asked him prior to assassinating him, they told him to commit suicide. And they call, and he called the Black Panther Party the most dangerous threat to internal security of the country. We almost at the end, family. Always at the end. The terrorist designation serves to undermine Black activism and anti-racism movements, as Patrice Kahn Kohlers and Asha Bende, authors of When They Call You a Terrorist, a, a Black Black Lives Matter memoir note, young black activists are called terrorists and receive death threats. I think what we've seen over the last four and a half years as this movement has grown is a continued, you know, black lash from the right and alt-right. And the first time, you know, we were called terrorists. I remember seeing our names on Bill O'Reilly's show and our faces. And I thought that this was frightening because I know who watches Bill O'Reilly Con callers recently said on Democracy Now. The truth is that the threat to police does not come from the black community. All right. The threat from police, it certainly doesn't come from black activists. It certainly doesn't come from us. It comes from typically aggrieved, angry, crazy, whatever we want to call it, white men, Mandel added, highlighting the need for black people to tell their stories to avoid the rewriting of history by those who are lying. 
the FBI focus on black identity extremists comes as white men emerge as America's preeminent domestic terror a threat, killing more Americans than are Islamic terrorists. They always want to say it's ISIS and it's all this, but black white men are really the goddamn terrorist family. It says that they kill more Americans than the Islamic terrorists. According to a report from the Anti-Defamation League, white supremacists have killed 51 police officers since 1990. But wait a minute, when we were reading the Black Identity Extremist Memo, they mentioned uh, the guy, Darren, whatever his name is, killed them in Dallas, right? Micah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, rest in power, brother Micah. But they mentioned Micah and said that he that he killed five Dallas police officers, right? Then they mentioned another brother who killed the police officers. I want to say it was in Tennessee, right? So you're looking at six police officers. But wait a minute. According to a report from the Anti-Defamation League, white supremacists have killed 51 police officers since 1990, as opposed to 11 officers killed by left-wing groups. White supremacists are infiltrating law enforcement across the country, a situation of which the FBI is aware and investigating. Yet while the FBI has designated black identity extremists as a terror threat, it has not similarly identify white extremist groups who are killing the vast majority of police suggesting politics rather than data are at play. At a November 2017 oversight hearing before the House Judiciary Committee, uh, uh, Representative Karen Bass pressed Attorney General Jeff Sessions on this racial discrepancy. Underscoring a troubling history on race, Strain relations between police and communities of color in a, in a legacy of implicit bias in law enforcement. The FBI has a black people problem. The agency is less diverse than it was two decades ago. And the percentage of black and Latino agents in this white law enforcement agency has decreased over the years with a dominance of white men at the top perpetuating a cycle and making the, the agency a target of discrimination lawsuits from African-Americans, Latinos, and women over the years. The Bureau is 83.4% white. Are you surprised, family? Because I'm not. 83.4% white, 6.5% Latino, 4.5% Asian, and 4.4% Black, according to the FBI website. Meanwhile, the FBI is also setting up a task force to monitor social media, which given the agency's history of singling out black movements poses, poses dangers for black activists who exercise their first amendment rights on Facebook, Twitter, and other platforms. Given the FBI report and the first apparent BIE prosecution in Dallas, black activists may have reason for concern the day will be next. Anyone who posts his or her thoughts on police violence on social media, particularly someone with a high profile and influence, is susceptible to FBI surveillance. Family, I had to read the entire article. I know you probably said, Dr. Bailey or Dr. Ma'at, this woman, I had to, family. Let me stop sharing my screen. I had to, family, read um, that article. It was very, very profound and very, very... Uh, informative. And um, today on my Facebook page, again, go to Deanna Bailey, okay, on Facebook. I'm going to post his information so that brothers and sisters can write letters to him so that we can put money on his books so that he can feed himself while he's in the federal facility. And we need to, um, as a matter of fact, let me do this. I'm sharing my screen with you all. Hold on. Because I want you to see that I don't just sit here and talk. I don't just sit here and talk, family. Let me go here. Let me show you this video really fast. It has the GoFundMe link in here, okay? And after I show you this video, after I show you this video, you're gonna see me go to GoFundMe, live on air, and promote a sum of money to his family. That's what we have to do. We gotta, you know, all this talking on YouTube and going live and everybody want to give a presentation and talk about this and talk about that. We need to be activists. We, we, you know, we talk too much in a black community. We talk, we talk, but we need to start doing. So here we go, y'all. This is a one minute video that his family put out there. 
Can someone please mute their mic, please? Can someone please mute your mic? I'll mute it then. I'll mute it. Let me stop sharing my screen. I'll mute it. Can't mute your mic, I'll mute it. I ain't got time, man. This is serious. You come in, I want, pe I want people to join the panel, but when you come in, man, mute your mic. Mute your mic. This is serious. And I got an attitude today. <laughs> Christ said, Dr. Maida's is in red form. She got an attitude. The sister got, yes, I have an attitude today. And I'm, just, I'm not for the nonsense. <laughs> So let's go, family. Let's see how much money he has in his GoFundMe right now. Someone say they say you can PayPal or you can go to GoFundMe.com. So let's go. Let's go right now and see how much money is sitting in there. All right, GoFundMe forward slash says four VH. 4VH. Four 4LNK. Four Hope I had it right, family. We can ready to see. Goodness, I did not spell it right. 4VH. Four, four, I believe it says, I believe it says L. Let me go to the front. 4VH. Four, four, yeah, that's what it says. 4VH, 4LILNK. It says campaign not found. Let me type in his name. Any results? Maybe it might be under his legal name. I know that this was the video that was uh, circulating. So family, this is what I'm going to do. I'm supposed to be getting in touch with the family today. A, a close friend of the family reached out. And when I get the correct, uh, oh, okay, maybe it's Rakeem Bolagon. Okay, so let me try this. Let me try something else. Let me try this. Maybe it's a pop up. Oh, so nothing's found, family. So don't <laughs> don't go to this uh, GoFundMe. Don't send anything there. So what I'm gonna do is find out the information, family. I'm gonna find out the um, oh man, I'm gonna find out the the correct information. Um, and I'll post it on my Facebook page. Or what I'll do is underneath this video in the description box, I'll post his information so you can send them money, mail them something. Uh, go fund me, whatever. But I want to get in touch with the family first. I know that that was the video circulating, but I don't want you to cash app money somewhere or PayPal money somewhere or whatever. We see that the GoFundMe page isn't up. And I don't know if it was up and then it was taken down. Who knows? But I'm going to find that out, family, and make sure um, that I um, that I get that information to you. Because I had my, you know, I got my little credit cards out right now and I was ready to make a, a, a daggone donation and my credit cards in front of me ready to um make a donation to this to this to his family 
But brothers and sisters on the panel, please speak. Thanks for joining us. I see Brother Stewart. I see uh, New Black Media, Brother Kofi. And I see Sister Jacqueline's in the building. Go ahead and unmute your mic, family. And, and, and just what are, what are your thoughts on this, this situation? Uh, peace and Black Power. Black Power. Right. Yeah. Um. I'm. I really like the um the, the information that you read. Um. It gave us a great overview and a lot of information to look at. It also shows us the um the conditions that we you know are living in. History is more than qualified to reward the researcher because it's just a repeat of history. You know what I'm saying? And um, a lot of people, uh, if we research history back when the Black Power movement was thriving or back when Garvey was still, a lot of numbers come out, right? A lot of people start joining. But then when shit started getting real, you know what I'm saying? We see the numbers drop off. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's those those waves of consciousness, just like we got to pay attention today. All of the fake people that's on YouTube that's playing black shit about to get real. Right. Yes. And this going to separate the real from the fake. You know what I'm saying? But we also got to come up with solutions to this because there's key things and key words. If they go back and read the things that you um, um, spoke to us and that you were reading. It shows that they are they are identifying people by certain things, right? So, what we got to do is is pay attention to who's around us, um, who try to get us into certain conversations, right? Um, who try to jerk your chain? Like, uh, you don't have to prove that you're a man. You know what I'm saying? Every time you go to the bathroom, you can identify that you're a man. Right. So That's right. When, when people try to get you in these conversations and try to get you to make com make statements and those statements are going to place you on a list. Right. And so the solution is to get around some of these things. I'm not saying that there was anything wrong with the brothers demonstration. I like the brothers demonstration. But if you identify the things that they used against them and they are doing this legally or they make shit up. Right. That's right. So the solution, the solution is just like in nursing, because I did nursing for a long time. We have a term called universal precaution. Right. So you don't know who may have a communicable disease. You don't know who may have a cold. You don't know who the agent is. You don't know who the provocateur is. Right. So they, they letting you know you are infiltrated. You are compromised. I don't care who you are. They are among us. Right. And we got to be able to protect ourselves from these people who are going to use law and bring us in the court to put us away. That's right. right. And so you got to know why you doing this. Why did you join the Black Power movement? Because shit is real. This shit is real. This ain't no play game. This ain't no bullshit. Them people is seriously saying that you can't be extremely black. Right. And for the record, I am extremely black. Facts. Right? Go ahead, <laughs> I am extremely black. That's right. But I use universal precaution. Right? Another solution I want to throw out there for us, you know, because some of us are not on religion. Some of us are not on the matter of is it old, all the spooky shit. But if you observe nature, right? Nature is very valid, isn't it? But none of the animals vocalize, I'll fuck you up. They actually hide themselves from the target that they intend to prance upon. So if we study nature, we'll understand that we don't have to visualize and vocalize. All we got to do is in nature continue to eat and feed, right? So that's some of the solutions. I ain't telling you to tone down on your rhetoric. I'm just saying be careful about your statement. You know what I'm saying? Because they will take your statement and bring you in court and put you away and you are no longer effective to the movement. Now, right. You no longer can be out on the street where you can work and do the work that you want to do, because it's kind of hard to do it behind prison bars. Right. right. But know that they're going to lock you up anyway if they really want you. Right. And so what they're against is the one who can electrify. The one who can unify, 
That's not right. the one who can divide us, but the one who can unify us and electrify us, right? Bring the word to life, right? So that's my perspective on what I just heard. You know what I'm saying? And turn up, right? If you are that leader, right, just be careful what you say. Be careful who you associate yourself with, right? You know, that's just a solution. We've heard the problem, but history is repeating itself. It ain't none but the Quarantel Pro uh, um, thing, the same thing they put on Garvey, the same thing they put on Malcolm X. They'll even contact you. I've been through this, man. I, somebody cloned my um, organization page, right? And they put all kind of fuck shit on there, all kind of crazy shit that does not even represent me. So I trace the people down. When I get the man on the phone, you know what the man told me? He said, oh, hold, on, hold, on, hold, on, hold on, hold on, hold on, brother New Black. Hey, brother Stewart, mute your mic because whenever you unmute your mic, we hear a lot of stuff. Thank you. Right, Go ahead, brother right, Black. Right. And the man told me, I traced it back to a cleaners somewhere in Texas, right? So I called the motherfucking place because I can search down shit just like they can search down shit. So I, the man get on the phone. I said, man, um, why y'all got a, um, a, 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 a page up with my using my name without my permission? He said, well, I'm with Brother Polite. Because I research history and because I know the FBI tactics, I just disqualified that polite shit because they was trying to turn me against somebody, right? Then I, I, I identified so much fuck shit that's going on. And, and so we got to realize that they'll contact you playing like they this person, right? And just to get us to fighting, right? But another thing I want y'all to understand is that the debates, the debates is fucking their game up, right? Because if you notice, we're becoming more friends. Some of us are becoming more friends through these debates. So we took, we took away from the FBI, we took away from the government some of the subjects that they would divide us over, right? And we are now controlling the subjects that they will use to divide us, and they don't like that shit. They don't like that shit, right? So let's turn up on that, but let's not fall victim to history repeating itself. How they turn you, you, know, you, you, you follow what I'm saying? I don't want to take a long time. No, 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 I follow exactly what you're saying, brother. I always say, you know, I used to say history repeat itself until I understood that it's just that mean it's just that it's it's culture that's being passed down, you know, like culture, mentalities, behaviors, those things are perpetuated. So yeah. yeah, exactly. So if a culture is perpetuate, is taught and perpetuated, right? Or if a mentality is taught and perpetuated, then you're going to see the same behaviors, right? Right, right. So is it really history repeating itself, or is it just that behaviors, culture, ideologies, values, attitudes, philosophies are being passed down from generation to generation? So it feels like history is repeated. Right, I can see, what, I can see that. Yeah, but, but what we're actually seeing is a daggone continuation. You get what I'm saying? Of, right, um, and, and we keep falling victim. Right. Absolutely. And like you said, brother, you made a great point that it's imperative that we study history. We got to study history. A lot of, you know, Dr. Amos Wilson tells us that, you know, when we think of history, a lot of people think of history as something that happened in the past. But but everything that happens presently is predicated on history. So if you want to understand your presence, if you want to understand your future, you have to study history. History isn't dead. History is living. And that's what our ancestor, right. Dr. Wilson, um, has taught us. And so you made a great point when you were saying, look, you know, you emphasize it several times. You said, I'm a student of history. So right. I know what's going on. I can identify the tactics. I can identify the methods that they use to neutralize us and subdue us and even annihilate us because I study history. A lot of people don't study history, brother. So they right. don't know what's going on. So when I say COINTEL Pro, people looked at me when I said, oh man, BIE is, is, is a COINTEL Pro 2018. They looked at me and they said, Doc, what are you talking about? Because they right. don't know the history. Right. Right. And that's why this show is so important right here, because this, this show is going to show them the history that they've been missing. You know, if they go back and listen to what you actually read, and then it shows us 
that there are two agents. It's a paid agent and it's a volunteer agent. Mm, let's right? talk about it, bro. Right? The mm. paid agent, I totally can understand the paid agent. He's doing it for money. But the one who's not getting paid, right? You got people that's not even getting paid and they doing shit better than the FBI. Is doing, mm. Right? And so this is the shit that makes it quite depressing sometimes, right? Mm. Because we know if we united overnight, our outer enemies would be no problem for us. We would we would dismantle them overnight. But the inner enemy, that volunteer one, that one that's not even getting paid for it, just make videos and videos and videos, attacking people, attacking people, and they're not even getting paid for this shit. Right. Then they make up uh, bullshit claims as to why they did this shit. Then when you go back and do the research, you find out that this motherfucker did the shit for this reason. They won't even get paid for this shit. So we got to go back again, yeah. Santa Copa, go back and fetch that which was lost. And that's the history of the operandi of how these organizations do things to pay the agent. In the volunteer agent. When you go look at the Corntail Pro itemized list of what's going on that Jay the Hoover wanted, look in the mirror and see if you actually living that shit out. You might be actually living the shit out mm. and you're not even getting paid for the shit. Mm. That means you should go to the nearest bridge and jump off that motherfucker. Jump off of it. Right? Because you are a shit old motherfucker. I right? say. I hate you motherfuckers, right? I hate you motherfuckers. I actually hate a motherfucker like that, right? So I ain't gonna take up all the time. This is King Shaw from New Black World Order TV. Subscribe to my channel, you know what I'm saying? Check me out. I'm actually about doing the work. You know what I'm saying? I like. I actually you know hate what? the fact. I just hey. actually hate the fact that some of the people, these unpaid volunteer agents, are not even doing no work. Right. And all they do is throw dirt. So the so the statement for 2018 is don't throw dirt. Right. Match my work. You know, yeah, don't throw dirt match my work. But you know what you people gotta all, also, you know, start asking for people's resume. Right. Facts. People throw dirt. What is your resume? Facts. What is your resume? What are you doing in the community? You got folks out here who want to teach. Show me your resume. Show me your work. And right. I don't want to see damn YouTube videos either. I ain't talking, and right. I do YouTube videos to talk and reach certain people. That's cool. But what is your, where is your resume, bro? Where's right. your resume? That's all, that's, that's all we saying is, you know, show us something that you're actually doing. That's you know something that saying? you're doing. Something because that you're other, doing. other than that, you're a cyborg. Absolutely. Other than that, you're a cyborg. You only exist in that world. We can't even see you. If I want to do that, then I'll just go play a fucking game on Facebook. Absolutely. Like, and, and live in a virtual world. Play cards with your ass or something like that. But my point is, um, soon as soon as you start doing some work, that's when they're going to put you on the that's list. They, you already saw right. what happened with me. You already saw what right. happened with me. But look, right. this show not right. about me. You already saw what happened with me. I was crucified. But when you come to Baltimore, Maryland, and you ask for Dr. Ma'at from Reality Speaks to Conscious Heads to Grindhouse to all of the spots in Baltimore, the conscious community, they know my name, they know my work, they know what I do. You know what I mean? Right. Even, if you, even if you holler at the Muslim brothers at Muhammad Mars Temple number six, the temple minister over there, Carlos Muhammad, call and ask him, does he know my name? Call and ask and, state's, state's attorney, Merlin and, Mose, they know my name, the they show, know my name. And the, right. Thank you. That's right. You got a resume and to show some balance. So show some balance is somebody like me and you in every city across the country. They're just not being recognized. They're being overlooked by the haters. Right. Yeah. So we don't want to act like there's nobody out here doing the work. I know based on That's a right. mathematical calculation that there's somebody in every city that's actually doing work. You know what I'm saying? They're Absolutely. just being overlooked. Right. So. And and brother, you and your wife are based in Virginia, right? Right, right. Me and my wife, we started we started Black Unity Day. You know what I'm saying? No, I, I saw it on Facebook. I was so proud of y'all. Oh my goodness, I'm so proud of the work that you and your wife 
are doing down in Virginia. We got to get something cracking in Virginia, man. Come down there, do a lecture, have a whole Facts. weekend down there and, and get it cracking in the summer. Facts. Facts. I appreciate that. No doubt. That's what's up. So I ain't going to take up a whole lot of time. You know what I'm saying? I want some of the other brothers and sisters to get a time to chime in on this. You know what I'm saying? So peace out. Black power. I appreciate the opportunity to be on this show. Hey, no problem, brother. Peace and black power. Yeah. No doubt. Look, brother Stewart, unmute your mic, brother. My brother, I think my brother got something to say. He kept unmuting his mic like I'm ready to go in. Brother Stewart, what's on your mind, King? Tell us what's on your mind, King. Please, can you hear me? I can hear you, can brother. You? How are you? I'm hey. doing next. I appreciate you uh, giving me the opportunity to be on the show. I just want to say most definitely a solidarity with my comrade, my brother, Rakim Cafe by Lagoon. A brother whom I've known for the better part of the past uh, six years, a hardworking brother in the community, a brother who has initiated the program called Gorilla Mainframe Martial Arts Program, a brother who has started a uh, food and clothing shelter program, a brother who has stood against police brutality, which we say is a euphemism for mm. police terrorism. This is a brother who has stood strong. This is a brother whom the FBI, for the better part of the past two years, the past 29 months, under special agent, Agent Kaylee, has followed this brother, has followed him to work, has followed mm. him home, followed him to his family, uh, followed us uh, through the uh, airport in Detroit, followed us all the way through Detroit, uh, sent agents in Detroit to people houses we're supposed to visit in Detroit. This is a very, very important brother that we have. He's a hardworking individual. He's a father of three. He's a stand-up guy. He's my comrade. He's our brother, which is supportive. Hey, brother Stewart, I, I can, let me ask you a question, brother. Is because I know you're supposed to be put right. I could hear you. I could hear you. I mean, you located on Facebook. To me, right? Was yes, it you? Say that one more time. I could hear you I say that again. I say. Are you the brother that I was communicating on Facebook who said that you, you would put me in touch with the family? Right, 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 right. 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 So, so yeah, uh, my, my comrade, my brother, uh, Robert Taylor, uh, reached out to you. That, that GoFundMe link, unfortunately, uh, the GoFundMe link has been taken down. Uh, it wasn't taken down by us. It was taken down us by external forces. Uh, so we have the cash apps available, and I'm sure in the chat, uh, my comrade brother Robert Taylor has, uh, you know, made note of what the proper uh, structure is to make some donations. But we very much so definitely need the donation. Not only do we need the donation uh, for Rakim, but we also need donations for his legal funds. As we do know, as you did mention, Doctor, uh, that uh, you've been in some some situation, et cetera. So you know these lawyers and things of this nature oh, yeah, cost, uh, cost a pretty penny. So this is the same thing with Rakim Balagoon, you know. So. We need all the support that we can get from the Black Power community, uh, mm -hmm. the revolutionary community, et cetera. We need all the support that we can get. Absolutely. We need to support those who are out here fighting for Black liberation. Who the hell want to keep on fighting for people who won't fight for them? That's ridiculous. And, 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 and also, as you did mention, most importantly, uh, as we as we saw uh, in terms of just studying Rock Kim's case, uh, particularly the FBI has did mention that they, they have been looking at people around the country. So, uh, aside from why Kim, this is something that everybody, especially those who are watching uh, this particular show here, is, is subject to monitor. They're, they're watching us very closely. Uh, they're using why Kim, of course, as the first uh, uh, attempt to try to uh, put somebody behind bars, et cetera. Uh, but they're, wa they're watching all of us. They're watching all of us that's connected. This BIE, Black Identity Extremist, is something very real. I saw on Facebook where someone had mentioned that this was a test case. How's in the test case when you got a man actually behind bars? Right, right. behind bars. Right. That, that was foolishness. Now. That was foolishness. That was foolishness. Right. Let me ask you a question, though, brother. Again, can you hear me loud and clear? Will you be I able to put me in touch? Loud. Will you be able to put me in touch with the family? Uh, I want to be directly in touch with his mama or his wife because what I intend to do is get a thousand dollars over there today. So, I mean, okay. I'm saying this live on air. We have people watching it, and this is being recorded. My intention, yes. I know they're trying to raise $20,000. I'm trying to give them $1,000 today. 
to help to okay. assist with whatever they need to get assisted with. So I need that information. So brothers and sisters who are watching, if you have his mama's number, uh, his wife's number, those are the way okay. I want to talk to women. <laughs> I want to talk to the women. So get me the mama's number or the uh, the, the, the the wife's number or baby right. mama's number, whomever right. that's dealing with him. I want to get that. I also want to get his right. information to the facility where he's located. I know with the feds, you had to have the name of the facility, the address, and his his name, his full name, and his they call it your inmate number. Because I right. want to send this brother, I want to send this brother mail. I want to send this brother books. I want to put money on this brother's books, and I also want to donate to his legal fund. So let me, yeah. So did you? Are you again? I know we were kind of going in and out. Are you the brother I was speaking to earlier today through Facebook? Let me go. I got my Facebook up now. That's brother. That's brother Robert Taylor. No, that's no, no. This is brother uh, Sunseer Ali Shakur. That's who okay. I was talking. Okay, Sunsi Ali Shakur. That's a good brother. Also, uh, brother Robert Taylor as well. Either either one of those, but primarily Robert Taylor is a good contact. You said Robert Taylor. Yes. Hold on, I'm on Facebook. I'm on Facebook right now. So Robert Taylor is his Facebook page says Tre Tres Vent High School, something like that. Yeah, that's him. Yeah, that's him. All right, that's let him. me. Yeah, let me. Uh, let me uh, send him a message right now. He can he can connect you with uh, with everybody whom you need to want to be in contact with, so on and so forth. Sister so, Alicia Cool is an excellent contact as well. You can reach to him, uh, but Robert Taylor is uh, he's directly here with us in terms of the Rock Kim Balagoon Defense uh, Committee, you know. So he's right here with us. Yeah, he just, yeah I'm gonna send him the link. He just asked me, he sent me his number, he just inboxed me at 1 17 p.m. Uh, let me let him know, uh, let him know that we're live now, bringing awareness to brother. Rakeem's case. Yeah, I need I need this brother's information ASAP. I need this brother's ASAP. information ASAP. Name, facility, ID number, so that we can send this brother money. And the good thing about the feds is that, you know, you can do everything electronically when you send money over there, so he can get it instantly hit to his books. You don't have to wait for them to process it. As soon as you send it with the feds, he'll get the money. I want to send this brother literature, and I also want to okay. make sure that his legal fees are paid for. I think the family... They're asking for uh, 20 people to donate $1,000. So is that what he needs, brother, $20,000? Brother Stewart, I, I said, does he I need $20,000? Yeah, the, uh, the cost of legal legal uh, legal uh, legal assistance is very expensive. So $20,000 is definitely our goal. That's something that we, we've been working very diligently, very hard for, to try to ensure that he has the proper uh, legal aid. Uh, as you know, um, okay, all right, and uh, okay, good, good, good. Get his information over to me, and um, I'll make sure that I get it out there, get the word out there. I'll post it under this video so that brothers and sisters can donate um, to this brother. Um, I appreciate you coming on the show, it was great to have like a comrade come and, and right. speak on his behalf. Are we friends on Facebook? Let me look, let me look. No, we're not. We not. I'm, I'm actually, I'm actually y'all fail by lagoon. I'm y'all fail by lagoon. All right, let me so see if I'm not. Let me type it in. You say, how do you spell it? Uh, you can put uh, Yafeo, that's Y-A-F-E-U-H. And then uh, I'm about to go on my last name on Facebook is Shamsuddin. That's S-H-A-M-S-I-D-D-E-E-N. Yafeo Shamsuddin on Facebook. Yeah, I'm trying to, yeah, I'm typing in. Yeah, <laughs> I'm typing yeah, it. Balagoon. Yeah, oh, Balagoon. Okay, Bal Balagoon. Got you. Okay, Google. I got Balagoon, you. Balagoon, no, Balagoon, the only, only thing that popped up was um uh the only thing that popped up was James Hassan Keaton Keith. Balagoon. Yeah. Oh, yeah, here that's you go. That's me. And that's then, me. no, are you? I see two. I'm James Hassan Keaton too. That's that's okay. one of my that's one of my Facebooks. Let me, let me look at you, brother, man. You got all these pages. I can't keep up with you. Let me I'm gonna say it's me. I'm going to just tell you and it's me. So, we, so we're connected now. All right. Comrade Robert Taylor, he says he's in the chat room. Robert Taylor, as soon as we uh, finish, as soon, brother, as we finish this um, 
live chat. I'm going to give you a call. Also got word from uh, Sunseer that uh, his wife, I, I want to say it was his wife that said she called. Hold on, because we're going to get her live on air if she is. Hold on one second. I don't know if it was his wife or his mother. Hold on. I wish I had like something to plug it up so people could hear. Hello. Uh, good, good afternoon. How are you, ma'am? How are you? I'm doing all right, ma'am. My name is Dr. Deanna Bailey. People know me in the, the uh, black community as Dr. Oya, my aunt by my African alias name. Are you the mother or wife of Brother Rakim uh, Caffrey? No, ma'am. I am the spokesperson for the uh, Free Rakim Malagoon Defense Committee. Okay, so you are uh, so you're somebody that's so you're the spokesperson of his organization? Yes, of the uh, defense committee. Of the defense committee. A, yes, members of his organization and close uh, allies of his. We formed the defense committee around this case, you know, for his legal defense and also to speak about the matter. So I'm the appointed spokesperson. Yes, ma'am. Is there any way that I can send you? Because right now uh, we're live on YouTube. Um, we're talking about his uh, his case. Um, uh, we, we, we read through uh, the, the, um, the article that was published by Atlanta Black Star yesterday. Um, we also um, read through the Black Identity Extremist Memo that was published uh, in August of 2017. And we talked a little bit about the COINTEL program uh, that was launched in 1957, just to show that this is, you know, this is nothing, it's not a new program. This is just a revived program. But we're live right now. Is there any way I could send you a link to get you on the show to address people? Because we have folks who want to donate. We have folks who want to write them, folks who want to send them things. And um, and we don't have any of that information. I tried to go to the GoFundMe and, and type that in, but it said it, it, no campaign exists. And so we want to know how we can support uh, his family and his organization. So can I send you a link right now to jump on in and, and speak on behalf of you know him, his family, and his organization? Yes, I'm uh, very willing to do that. I just have one question. Is it will it be audio or visual? Uh, it is visual right now because we're broadcasting uh, through Google Hangout on on YouTube. So uh, I look a hot mess. No, you don't. You can you can take your camera off. You do. You can take you can take the camera off. So I can send okay. you the I can send you the link. Yes, ma'am. And just uh, click on the YouTube link, and then what happens next? No, not the YouTube link. Do you have a Facebook page? I do. All right. So give me your Facebook page. And what I'm going to do is inbox you a link to join the Google Hangout. And once you join the Google Hangout, just turn off your, um, just turn off your, yeah. yeah, just turn off your camera and, and then just speak. So what is your, uh, your Facebook page? Okay, my Facebook page is K-I-L-A-I-K-A. Face. Mm -hmm. A N A Y E. Got it. Yeah. Last name Baruti. Uh, Last name Baruti. Uh, yes, that's correct. All right. So I just sent you the link and uh, I'll be waiting for you to hop on in, okay? Okay. I'm going to get in there right now. All right, my sister. All right. Thanks. Thank you, my sister. Bye. Bye bye. All right. Okay, brother, brother Kofi, brother Stewart got in there. We had brother from the New Black Order. He got in there. Brother Kofi, do you have any words, brother? Uh, I appreciate you having me on the show. Um, well, I'm just keep it short so uh, the lady can get in here. But uh, yes, it's like like you said earlier. It's this is nothing new. Um, it's very important to study uh, history because if you study history, you'll see that this stuff has been going on through time and memorial and anything that's like like this black extremist thing. This this like I said, this is nothing new. Like you said, it's nothing new. This same thing that you've seen with the COINTEL Pro. Anything that's dealing with uh, black uh, black civil rights movement, uh, uh, black power movement, and so forth. They are surveilling. Uh, 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 the FBI is surveilling and infiltrating these different organizations. These people that are coming in, uh, uh, putting in work in the uh, community, 
making people aware of things that are going on and setting up uh, stuff where we can protect and provide for ourselves. You see the same things are happening over and over. So it's again to, like you said, to study history. Because you see it through the Black Panther Party. You've seen it through uh, the Marcus Garvey uh, uh, movement. You've seen it through the Civil Rights Movement for with Martin Luther King. You've seen it uh, with the Nation of Islam and so. And I can just keep naming and naming. So this is uh, um, nothing new. Um, and it's a shame, like you said, there's a lot of people that don't know about uh, BIE or know about COINTELPRO or know about J. Edgar Hoover and what the FBI has uh, um, done to our community and what they continue to own doing to our community. I appreciate uh, the information that you uh, put up on the, uh, you know, you put up on the screen to inform people of what is BIE and what is COINTELPRO. So hopefully those that's in the chat can go and um, research and see what's going on and even study history to see what's going on so they can be aware of, of things that's going around them and be careful like what the brother was saying with uh who you have around you and uh what are you saying you know because you have agents that are all uh excuse me that uh that are, that are amongst us so again I, like i said i just wanted to keep it short i appreciate you bringing me on the show i appreciate you for sharing the information with the uh the family and whatever i can do uh to help out uh to donate i may not be able to donate a big amount but whatever i can help uh this brother uh just let me know hey man i appreciate you brother kofi joining i know this like again this was like impromptu man i just sent you the link like look we got to discuss this you know and i've been in my feelings about it since uh since i read the article yesterday and I said, we just got to do more than just talk on YouTube. Like, it's ridiculous. You know, and I'm not saying that people don't do more than just talk on YouTube. But I think that we should be using these platforms to raise awareness on different issues and not just raise awareness, to do something. And um, I'm just looking at this brother and I'm looking at his resume. I went through his profile pic and you saw Brother Stewart gave his testimony. All these different programs that this brother is starting in the community, a defense program, a feed the homeless program, and we don't we can't raise twenty thousand dollars for a person like that who's sitting in a prison right now. He's been in prison almost two months. They said that they raided his home on December the twelfth, I believe. So he's been in prison literally almost two months, and the family is struggling to raise twenty thousand dollars. And he's put his life on the line for black people, and the family is struggling. I have a problem with that. I mean, I really have a problem with that. Then you got black people who run around and say, well, we don't have any leaders. We don't have, who the hell want to lead a group of people that they stick their neck out for and they don't support them? You got to support. That's why, you know, I saw, I know a lot of brothers and sisters who are black entrepreneurs in a community. They're talking about stop that. I'm going to stop producing. I'm going to stop doing this because they don't have the backing of the black community. Brother Kofi. I'm here. Do you hear what I'm saying to you, brother? Yes, I understand. I mean, um, it goes through a lot of people here. We don't want to do things because we can't get the people to to um back us and, and to back support. us back us up and things. To um, support. Right, right. Right. I to mean, support. That's, that's, that's ridiculous. You know, I always tell people I'm tired of black Anglo Saxons. And they look at me, Doc, what are you talking about, black Anglo Saxon? I'm tired of black people with white minds. You know, it is no reason. Now, look, Freedom Paper, this is a black owned company that produces toilet paper and paper towels. But I guarantee you, you still use Scott, Charming, Bounty. Where does your loyalty lie? It's definitely not, it's definitely not to black people. Freedom Paper, that stuff should be selling off the shelf. And now that I mention it, for those who don't know about Freedom Paper Company, which is owned by a Muslim brother. I'm talking about a black Muslim brother in the nation of Islam. We all should have 40 million people. We all should have freedom paper in their house. I have toilet paper and paper towels in my house by freedom paper. You got people who don't want to produce anything because black people don't support. Either we don't know about it or we just don't support it. You get what I'm saying? I'm sitting over here thinking about true laundry detergent. 
They should be selling out. They should be selling out. But guess what? Let me let me meet your mic, sis. They should be selling out, but they're not. You're still using Tide and, and Snuggles and all of that other crap. But your own brothers and sisters have a, have a laundry detergent that you don't buy. Your own brothers and sisters have trash bag liners that you don't buy. Your own brothers and sisters have clothing that you don't buy. And you mad at H&M. I'm a boycott H&M. What the hell are you spending your money with, with H&M for any goddamn way? Why aren't you spending your money with Abjuwear, right? Abjuwear, Nagas, all these brothers and sisters who make apparel for black people. And you mad at H&M, right? And I'm thinking about the shoes, black pa or panther wear. Why you got Nike on your feet? Nike and Adidas and all that. People that don't invest in your community, you walking around supporting them. It's crazy to me. Then not to mention Meltrek, brother Kofi an animated series that teaches black children black history from a black perspective. An animated series that projects positive images of black people into the consciousness of black children. That should be flying off the shelf right now. But no, you still have your children watching Nickelodeon, Cartoon Network, Disney, and Pixar. And look at the filth that they show your child. So you won't support Meltrek but you'll have your children watch Nickelodeon, Cartoon Network, right? Uh, Nick, uh, Disney, right? Cartoons that are filled with filth. You don't support Tell Me Who I Am by Kid Positive, another animation created by black people who teach black children about who we are and projects positive images of black people or into the psyche of black children. You don't support them. You don't support Bino and Fino a company that's in Africa that produces children animation. You don't support Akua Agusti, an author that creates books, children books for black children. No, you want to go buy your children, Dr. Seuss. Black people, and I'm telling you right now, and when I say this, I have evidence to support it. Black people have a mental and personality disorder, according to black psychologists. Dr. Cabon has said it. Dr. Amos Wilson has said it. Uh, Dr. Naeem Akbar has said it. We really have a mental and personality disorder. And that's a fact. Due to, be, due to being exposed to the system of racism and white supremacy. And there's no way around that. Y'all can bring whoever you want to bring on this platform and I will beat them up with the words of our ancestors and elders to show you that black people are literally out of our minds because we don't know who we are. And that's a fact. And look at how we operate. Would you say, Brother Kofi? I'm saying that's a fact. You sounding like I'm I mean, sounding on my uh, presentation, Igual Pele and Ori Tutu. That, that's a fact. I mean, you speaking. I, I just go co signing what you're saying. <laughs> Brother Kofi, it's true. I was reading the book, Developmental Psychology of the Black Child. Dr. Amos Wilson said that all black people in America are dysfunctional. Different levels, but he said all of us have dysfunctional qualities due to racism and white supremacy. I'm reading a book right now called Cultural Misorientation by Dr. Cambon. He said the same thing. He said, because we grew up in a developmental space that is pr predominantly Eurocentric, he said that we are culturally misorientated, meaning that we operate with a European consciousness. So what you have are black Anglo-Saxons out here, black people with white minds. That's why nobody felt guilty, brother, about watching the Super Bowl. You think that they cared about uh, Cap taking a knee and, and being ostracized? No, nope. black folks kept on watching. Black folks, we kept on watching. Black skin, white minds, France for non. Dual consciousness, W.E.B. Du Bois. Schizoid nature, Dr. Amos Wilson. These are things that our psychologists have been saying that we are literally out of our minds. Anyway, we got the sister online. Sister, go ahead. Unmute your mic, sis. I'm sorry. I, I just got emotional just now, my sister. Just talking about just talking about brother Rakeem and how the brothers, how the family is struggling to raise twenty damn thousand dollars. Here it is. You got a brother out here fighting for black liberation, and the very same people that he's fighting for is not supporting him. George Zimmerman, when George Zimmerman 
Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Sister Jackie. I just read your message. You say you're about to hit out. Say good show, peace and blessings. I'm sorry, your brother, Sister Jackie. Do you want to say a few words? This why you're on here. Yeah. Go ahead, sis. I'm sorry. Um. Well, I think uh, I want to make this, but um, this show is pretty good. You made uh. A very good point about the consciousness or the state of mind of Black Americans right now, and I'm at this time wondering if what he is doing and what we're doing online is it even worth doing when we have so many of us that are literally not only out of our mind, but we are so far out of our mind that so many of us are not even going to come back. Mm. So, <clears throat> because I'm just going to be honest about it. I really don't think that how so many of us are putting our necks out there, especially on social media, um, talking in the way that we're talking, and then we're not going to get some from the majority of our own people in the first place. That's right. So my personal opinion is that when it comes to social media and even the black power movement or whatever you may want to call it, I think that And I don't, I'm not trying to sound mean about it, but I think now it's time to just be quiet on it, at least mm. on social media. Um, I think the main focus now, because we are so much out of our mind, we're trying to take all the take on this kind of like lofty movement to deal with these bigger issues of what's going on in our community. But our foundation is totally destroyed. You know, I, I hear so many people who claim to be about, you know, fighting the man or fighting, you know, law enforcement or fighting this and that. But we're not fighting for our families. We're not fighting for our children. Mm -hmm. Hell, we got black men and black women. We got a war right now within our own community. We can't even get along. And then the ones that, are talking about me you got so many hypocrites contradictory behavior mm. uh, among people that are claiming to be pro-black and then you got the ones like well you know I, i'm pro-black but i'm uh you know i'm not anti-white and they really saying in cold that you know i'm pro-black but i love sleeping with white people mm. you know but it, it's like but you you want to fight the power, but you want to lay up with power with the same type of people from the same type of culture that you're fighting 24-7. That's psychological madness to me. But then you want to say you're pro-black. So my issue with the black community is the problem with being consistent. Especially, I'm, I got a real big issue with this pro-black conscious people pro-black power movement people. They talk too much. They put on too much for me. Both of them not doing nothing. A lot of this is just online venting. It's, it, it's, it's online. People are showing off online. They're talking about what they want to do online. It's like, are you doing this for likes? Are you doing this for popularity? Are you doing this just to look good and bad? And I mean look good and bad, not only just for other black people, but maybe you can get some more um, white interest. Mm. You know, what? what is it? So to me, I, I'm sorry, Dr. Maya, but I'm a little bit cynical right now with this black power movement that we got going on because I see so many people talking, so many people advertising. It's like they're trying to make it a trend, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Something that they can, even among certain 
uh, so-called black conscious speakers and the so-called black conscious circuit, you know, they're going around, they're, they're talking, they're doing lectures, they're doing debates. It's about M-O-N-E-Y. That's right. Money. So the thing about it is, if we, to me personally, I'm not trying to put any, I'm not going to tell nobody what I'm doing. It's actually on networks and I'm not running, operated by me. This is on social media, what a lot of us are doing. You're doing this on Facebook. You're doing this on YouTube. You're doing this on Instagram. You're doing this on Twitter. Do any of us run and operate that? No. This is going out to the whole world and you blasting what you're going to do, what we need to do, how we need to do it. X, wrong, wrong, wrong. That should just be a big X right there. You yeah. set yourself up to be a target. You set yourself up for those things. If you really were serious about this and you already know what the FBI is doing, you already know you're being monitored. You're already being watched. I'm just saying, don't you think you might want to go in a different route? Maybe you need to regroup and rethink about how you're going to do this. Right. That is, we need to use some common sense. But this is another issue. I, I wouldn't even say common sense, because common sense in the world right now isn't good sense. We need to use some good sense. My personal opinion is that number one, we need to stop talking too much. Hmm. We need to stop trying to have this online pro black, uh, black power uh, uh, movement online, telling everybody our problems, telling everybody what we're going to do. Okay, you putting everybody on alert. It's like putting everybody in your bedroom in your business. So those are the first two things. And then the third thing is I really don't think we are even mentally nor emotionally nor economically prepared to take on what we're trying to take on. We don't even have our relationships right. We don't have our homes right. Can't even raise our kids right. But we're going up there and take on America. Right. Take building getting your mind right take on uh having proper functional healthy productive relationship with between a black man and a black woman that is the foundation of any nation we That's can't right. do that. start there be revolutionary with that take your revolutionary behind on and try to build with somebody within your family or within your community start with that treating that black man with some level of decency and respect and vice versa black man start treating that black people with some level of decency and respect stop having these kids out of wedlock like some cockroaches and you got all these kids running around they don't have any kind of stable family structures or units they, don't, they can't even model a basic relationship because they can't see it between you. I'm talking about what we're doing within our community. That's right. We're doing damaging. We're having, like you said, it goes back to our own dysfunctionality. We are All of us are dysfunctional on some level or another. It's just that some of us are worse off than others, but some of us can still function and try to do something positive. And those are the ones I'm focusing on. That's what right. Is focus on getting yourself right. Get your character right. Get your morality in order. Get your values right. Get your ethics right. And no, I'm not saying that our problem, I'm not doing that uh, blaming the culture for our oppression. Because I, I don't follow that theory. I don't follow that philosophy. That, that I don't do the money hand report. You remember that? And he was trying to blame the culture of blacks. No, I'm not that stupid. I know what's going on. That's so right. That we already know we have these outside elements of influence, you know, influencing our behavior. 
and we have been reactionary to it. But I'm saying stop being reactionary to it. Recognize how these forces are impacting your community, impacting your psychology, impacting your behavior, and then find a, count, a way to counter that and to still stay unified. Because we're talking about the black community, black men, we have no black community. That is dead. We gotta wake up. That's gone. It's destroyed. Mm. But we have our black people that live in America. Come yeah. on, talk about it, sis. We haven't talk had a black community in decades now. So we need to stop we need to start how you gonna fight for people or a community or a nation. Well, number one, we got identity issues. We don't even know how to identify. We still conflicted on that. We don't even have a community, and we don't even function as a nation. We know about we gonna fight as a nation and a community. Shut up, build mm. first. Build your communities first. Build your and starting with build your mind first. Deal with your woman, your black woman, not your replacement women. Over here and over here and over here, not these replacement men over here, over here. A black man and a black woman. That's the only people that create a black family, not everybody else. So you need to start learning how to get along with each other because you're not doing it right now. Y'all cutting food in front of social media, in front of everybody, and embarrassing the hell out of yourself. Hmm. So you don't even have a black community and nation to fight for if your if your essential institution of your black family is broken. And we damn near broken. So we need to start on that. We need to start on that. So what I'm saying right now, we gotta go to square one. Everything is lost right now. It's broken. It's damaged, it's destroyed, it's gone. So, if we want to talk about being revolutionary or anything, the first priority to me will be to get our relationships back in order and get our families back in order and get our kids back in order. That's number one. You know what I was saying to that? I agree 300% with you. I think that the first step would be to transform our consciousness. And then once we transform our consciousness, then like you said, we will get our character together. We'll get our values together. We'll get our relationships together. We'll get our families together, right? And then once we get our families together, then you have a, you can build a community because a community is nothing but a network of families. You can build institutions within that community. So I'm with you 200%, uh, Sister Jackie. And I, think I do that support, I support what you uh talking about. let like... <laughs> But what I'm saying, we, uh, to me personally, for our own protection, and, and if we're trying to do something positive in our community, you already know that you're being targeted. Why are we still going on social media and still telling everybody what we're going to do, how we're going to do it, how we need to? Come on, man. It's true. We're going to have to find a better, a better means or a different mode of communicating. We really have to do that. We got to stop talking so much. Mm. Like that. We got to stop telling everybody else what we're going to do, how we're going to do it, when we're going to do it. You know, come on. We got, if we, you know, and it's not, you know, that. that's why I don't, you know, I will never say what is really true of my personal feelings or how I think or how I think things need to be done. If I want to have those type of conversations, they are definitely going to be in private, and they're definitely going to be person to person. It's like we forgot the art of grassroots movement and the art of moving, and maybe you, we have to find ways to operate in in a less obvious manner. But, you know, we have to be able to learn from our mistakes. It's like we already know how we was were treated when we didn't have social media, right? That's right. You are how we were tracked down when we didn't have social media. But now we're just making it even more easier. <laughs> well, you know? So 
And the thing about it, what I guess my focus right now is that we have to really repair some of the things that's going on amongst us within Black America. And we have to be prepared for the reality that I say, me personally, the majority of us are going to be lost. That day at way. That day at way. And, and it's a waste of time trying to convert them because they're not going to be converted. What we're dealing with, uh, Dr. Maya, see, what we're dealing with is that we are the generation that was raised post Jim Crow. Right? So we was taught this colorblind society. We was taught about integration, you know, and multiculturalism and diversity and all this. We were even furthermore acculturated um, into the dominant Western society, even more so than the generations before us. So what we're dealing with now is even mm. though we have this consciousness of let's be diverse, let's be with everybody, let's be one with everybody, let's all be colorblind, but we're faced with this reality that that is not the reality that we live in. So it's conflicting. We have these two, we have the ideal, and then we have the reality. And I really don't think our generation, from the generation X to the millennials, are actually prepared to deal with that. No, I don't think so either, sis. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I said I agree with you. I don't think that they are I don't think that they are prepared to deal with this either. Right. It's like we're still trying to figure this out. You know, and it's like we're having, we already had an issue with, like you said, the double consciousness, right? The Western, westernized mind. And then we have been taught, well, we have been taught post, you know, uh, legal segregation. And then now we're faced with this reality of this strong, you know, overtly, um, what people call overtly racist, you know, um, Back by from the from the right, what they say from the white or the conservatives or the alt right movement, right? So we have not dealt with this kind of um, blatant, open, you know, targeting or discrimination or racism like that. We have been so used to the subtleties, you know, the covert version of it, and then been fed, you know, colorblind you know, post-racial reality. And so I think that is conflicting uh, with now what we're facing with the reality, and we're all trying to figure it out. But it's, and it's the thing that I think too many of us are just, we're just goodbye. You know, we're just gone. You know, we're going to hold on to that narrative and that idealism even though in the face of the reality that is counter to that, we're still just going to hold on to that and ride that out. We're just too brainwashed. You know, so I really think that it's going to come down to if we are going to survive as a people, um, it's going to be small pockets of us, small collective groups of us that are actually going to keep a unified, in some form of a unified community, and really we have to form that. But this idea of this mass movement or um, this mass empowerment, to me, now I know people may disagree, but I don't think it's going to happen. I think, I think, I think that's gone. <laughs> I think that's gone, but I do think that it, I think we need to get like the Mormons, <laughs> or get like you know, uh, you know, you have the uh, the E Five Village in South Carolina. You know what I'm talking about, right? You know that village in South Carolina, Doctor Maya. Yeah, I know you're talking about sis. I plan on taking a trip down there right. and taking the tour of the village. Saying, what I'm saying is that it's going to get to the point where I really see us having being small pockets of us trying to maintain. But I don't see 
this mass movement of that the because the totality, the collective of black Americans, like you said, we are, you know, we are whitewashed, right? So Absolutely. the totality of it, we're really going in and we're going to be further assimilated and to the dominant culture. I really see many of us going in a direction which you see uh what you find in uh, um many of the South American countries. That's the direction that we're going. I think, you know, some some of us are trying to fight against that, but too many of us want it. Want it. That's what we want. Mm -hmm. Frankly, but that's what a lot of us want. We want to go that way. We want to integrate. We want to assimilate. We want to go into that direction. But we're they're doing that and without outright challenging, you know, the white supremacist system. So what's going to happen is going to just be just like in Latin America. You're going to have a mixed race majority. You're going to have a decrease of, of the uh, black African people. You're going to have a very small percentage of black that are not highly admit. The majority of the population is going to be admit. And then you're going to have those that are very light, near white or white, still at the power. They're still going to hold that. I see that coming in the next maybe 20 or 30 years. Because that is the mindset of how many black people are born right now. Even in the face of this, what we see, what we see as adversity and, you know, blatant racism and stuff. But so many of us are still choosing to ignore it and they're still pushing along because they want to fulfill what they say. Well, what about Dr. King's dream? You know, what about the civil rights movement that they, you know, and what we, our parents taught us about we're going to fight on until we're all as one. You get what I'm saying? That's been ingrained in our mindset. Hmm. That's been ingrained in our mindset to assimilate to integrate, to practice miscegenation, to be one, to be socially integrated with everybody. That has mm -hmm. been ingrained since we have been children. So that is the direction that a lot of us are going into. So I think that's where you might find, you know, Dr. Mayan, when you say, well, where is the support for this? You know, why isn't anyone talking about it? Because they're not on that. Most of us are not on that. We're oh, absolutely. On that. That's what fulfill the dream. You get what I'm saying? And that dream absolutely. is a one race dream. And everybody living together, and everybody loving each other, and everybody working together, and all this stuff. That's and, that's, and, that's, and that's not and that's not the case. And that's why I encourage all brothers and sisters. Let me grab this book. Oh my goodness! Let me grab this book. I encourage all brothers and sisters to read this book, Blueprint for Black Power. When I tell you that Dr. Amos Wilson talks about this and he talks about why, he talks about why because we, the black race or the black ethnic group, whatever you want to call yourself, black, more, Washita, African, whatever, we don't conceive of ourselves as a nation within the nation and organize and function as such. And he said that's one of our major problems. That instead we're, we fed into multiculturalism, we fed into integration, even though evidence has shown us that we have been denied full participation in this American nation. We've been denied full participation. We're segregated residentially and we're also segregated uh, in the economic system. And he talks about that in his book. So, sis, I agree 100% with what you're saying, sis. And um, I want to hold you. I know you said you were getting ready to roll out about 20, 30 minutes ago. Um, so I don't want to hold you, sis. And I want to give sister. Uh, uh, her name. I to say one thing before I go, Dr. Mai. Yes, ma'am. All, all I will say at the end is that to me right now, I would just say we just need to turn, go inward. And really, let's just say our house has burnt to the ground. And it is in shambles. Mm. And so I'm 
Huh? And my focus is building that house, starting with the black man and the black woman, getting our minds in order as individuals and coming together and getting right with each other again. And then we can go from there. Mm. Mm. But that's just me. Everybody may not be on the same tip, but that's my main focus is the black family right now. Mm. And, and like you said, the black family, building the black family is that's the that's the that's the primary. I don't, I don't even know if I would want to use the word primary, but that's the you know, that's the, the basic block. That's the atom of a nation, the family structure. And right. so I, I agree with 100 uh, percent, Sister Jackie. And Dr. James Wilson said in his book, Blueprint for Black Power, he said that the black race is a house divided in itself. And that's exactly what we are right now, Sister Jackie. Again, sis, I appreciate you coming through. Um, I know that this was like an impromptu uh, discussion. I was kind of in my feelings when I woke up this morning thinking about Brother um, Rakim Caffrey. And I said, you know, I wanted to go live to bring awareness uh, to his situation. But I totally understand what you're saying, that we need to shut up and be more silent and, and more smart, you know, about the way more, more I guess the word I'm looking for is perspicacious about the way we move. And, and so we need to be sis, and I and I agree hundred percent with you that we need to be more strategic right. and not air everything on social media, right? Um, because they're monitoring social media. We know that at this point. So I understand what you're saying, sis, and I appreciate the perspective that you brought uh, to the discussion. Thank you, and peace and love to everybody on the panel. Oh, uh, peace, love, and light to you, sis. Okay. And I'll be in touch. I always hit you up here and there, so I'll be in touch with you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Take care, my sister. Peace and love. Peace and love. Sister Kalika. Yes, I'm Unmute here. Your mic. Can you hear me clearly? Yes, yes, yes. Well, I, well, I want to thank you for allowing me to be on the platform and to talk about um, the case concerning Rakim uh, Balagoon, also reported as uh, Christopher Daniels. Uh, in the reports that you have uh, read through some of the uh, blogs, such as the Atlanta Black Star and the foreign policy uh, documents. Uh, his government name is Christopher Daniels, but we respectfully, in our African community, call him Rakim Balagoon, also known as Chief of Guerrilla Mainframe and Geronimo hmm. Tactical. Hmm. Ashe. So, I, yes, ma'am. So I don't know how much time I have, but I would like to go in some of the details uh, of the case, if that's Please okay do, with sir. you. Please do, because the only thing that we had um, when I began to show was the article that was published by Black Atlantic Star. Um, I appreciate uh, the comrade. I want to, his, his, his name says Stuart on the panel. But I know he goes by something else, but he was able to come on and, and speak to the case. And then when I was checking my Facebook message, he was message um, no, 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 my brother in the chat room mentioned you. And that's when I went ahead and, and um, they, they said you called me earlier and I returned the call. But I want to hear from the fam, from the organization what's going on. So far, we've heard what Black Atlantic Star said and, you know, what, what the news is saying. But, you know, we would want you to tell us your perspective on the case. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I do highly uh, appreciate the articles that have came out. Uh, the articles pretty much do give uh, great detail as far as uh, what has transpired. And uh, I'm very thankful uh, for that because it's very helpful. And I think that is uh, very well uh, represented. So I do want to point that out, that the details of the case have been uh, conveyed um, in a, uh, a way that I say is very factual. So, okay. um, but I think that um, there is something that I could add to it that can give people a greater uh, perspective of it. Um, on December 12th, Rakim uh, Balagoon had his door kicked in at around 4 o'clock a.m. by uh, FBI and ATF agents. And on um, December 15th, 
three days later, uh, inside of the courtroom at the hearing, there was uh, details about that particular day and what led up to that date on December 12th. And so the information that I will share with you pretty much came from uh, the courtroom. Um, they said, which was an agent, an FBI agent who took the stand, he pretty much said that on August, of t in the month of August 2015, they had uh, saw Rakim in uh, Austin, Texas, along with other uh, people who were doing an open carry demonstration. Um, these people were pretty much led by Rakim, where they uh, was doing open carry and they were uh, saying certain chants, like certain chants you may have heard before, like oink, oink, bang, bang, and so forth like that, and uh, there's no such thing as a good pig but a dead pig. Uh, these chants that uh, they heard on this date, um, they were absolutely allowed to say, which is the reason why no one was apprehended on that particular day, but they were within their First Amendment right, you know, to chant such things, and they were also within their right uh, to bear uh, arms in an open carry state. And so this demonstration that they did was to bring awareness to uh, African communities and other oppressed people that they have the right to carry and so forth. So these demonstrations are a strategic effort and move to educate people. Also to confront uh, the aggressive forces of uh, police brutality and police terrorism and to let the people know that, hey, we can organize against such things. So we look at these demonstrations, not protests, but demonstrations as strategic uh, maneuvers to educate people. So the FBI agent said that that's when he uh, found out who Rakim was. And what they decided to do over the course of two years and four months was to follow him, follow him uh, physically and also follow him through his social networks to learn everything that there was to know about this man. But why, why was this man isolated? One reason why I would say that uh, Rakim was isolated out of the many people that was there is because he's a very strong and stout uh, African man. Um, he's very knowledgeable. He's very well trained in a hand-to-hand -hand combat. He's very trained in arm maneuvers. He's a, a very skillful man. And this man leading the pack is considered uh, more so a threat than the pack itself. So they said that they isolated him and they followed him for two and a half years. Upon the uh, following, like I said, uh, physical, which was staking out at his house, uh, following him back and forth to work, to his everyday uh, community activities, just knowing he, who he was. In that uh, two years and four months. Let me, let me, they, let me interrupt. Let me, let me interject really fast. Was he aware that they were following him? Uh, not particularly like the uh, details, but being a person um, like Rakim and many other activists, you know, in our communities, we have some idea, but not in grave detail to say, hey, I see you, I can point you out. No, ma'am. Absolutely not. No, ma'am. Okay. And so, okay. This, this, yes, ma'am. This Asian um, said that uh, upon, you know, investigating who this man was, they saw on his social media uh, two things. I don't know if you're familiar with uh the dallas police uh shootings that took place in 2016. absolutely but, um, absolutely absolutely i posted the brother micah's picture on my page he said that i'm in full support of what he did yes ma'am yes ma'am well just like you rakim uh expressed um uh, that this individual micah x was uh somewhat heroic in nature um he kind of identified him as like a, a Nat Turner or a something of that nature. 
He is. And there was two, there was two things that uh, they said Rakim had wore a T-shirt that commemorated the day 7-7, uh, uh, which was the day uh, that those things happened. And secondly, they said that uh, he made a post that was something to the nature of, while they mourn, uh, we celebrate, or something to that effect. And so the agent said that we take issue with these postings. Now, the mm. public defender at the time, she did a pretty good job at stating, uh, well, sir, you do realize that uh, Rakim Christopher Daniels is within his First Amendment right to a freedom of speech to be able to express those things. And he did acknowledge, as well as the judge, that he was within his First Amendment right to acknowledge those things. And she went on to ask, well, sir, in the two years that you've been following this man, did you see him engage in any illegal activity or anything of that nature? And also, did you see him make any postings or refer to any uh, instances of going to hurt anyone or committing any acts of violence against law enforcement agents or any civilians or anything to that effect? And his answer was, no, he did not. <coughs> and so, <clears throat> the conversation uh, kept going after that was acknowledged. And he then stated that, so upon following the social media, um, Rakim Balagoon, along with others, because we do a lot of community work, and our community work isn't just subjected to the city of Dallas, but there's African people throughout the world that we have to connect with. So he That's saw that Rakim was traveling to Detroit, Michigan, to do a, a, a training, a, a political education class with some uh, people up that way. So the agent said they followed him. They followed him. This is what the transcript says. I'm not making this up. He said that they followed him to Detroit. And Rakim let us know that upon going to Detroit, going through TSA, it was kind of shaky going through there like he actually missed his flight because he couldn't get past the checkpoint like normal but nonetheless he got past the checkpoint now when he got past the checkpoint he missed his flight but nonetheless he proceeded and when he arrived in detroit he noticed that his luggage he checked in a uh, uh, luggage he noticed that his luggage was missing. Mm. Nonetheless, he was only there for two days. So, okay, I do without my luggage. Just like any other person, I report my luggage as lost. You know, do claim a claim on it. Mm -hmm. So he did that. But what the FBI agent said to us, which uh, Rakim did not know until after the arrest, was that they actually seized his luggage. Now, when they seized his luggage, they, of course, went through his luggage. And upon going through his luggage, they found a, a, a handgun. And this handgun uh, was checked in, just like everything else, uh, through the proper procedure. You can check in a handgun as long as it's uh, not loaded and it is in a hard case. This was checked in, and it, Rakim was expecting it to arrive in Detroit, but because they actually stole his luggage, and I use that word stole because that's what happened. He did not have his luggage or his handgun. So when Rakim made it back to Dallas, that lost luggage that he had uh, reported was delivered to his home by the airline. The airline, just like anybody else, Oh, hello, sir. Knock, 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 ding dong. Here's your luggage. Here's your luggage. Everything was inside of the luggage just as he had left it, including the handgun in his case. Now, three weeks later, that date that I mentioned to you, December 12, because this happened on November 17th when he took the flight out and returned and back on the 18th. Three weeks later on December 12th, his door is kicked in, not a knock on the door, not a phone call or anything, but his door was kicked in with a warrant 
to get that very item that was returned to him in the luggage. And in addition to that, they had a list of other items that they wanted to seize. Any other firearms, any other uh, tools or accessories that go with firearms, and any books uh, or, that, uh, or training manuals that have to do with firearms or any ideological uh, instrument reading material that have to do with firearms. So uh, one of the things I think is very important that I mentioned is that they seize the book that he uh, possessed called Negroes with Guns by Robert F. Williams. And they also uh, sees his training manual of his organization. Now, what is very interesting that I later found out is that the um, agent later said that the airlines called him to the airport because of the firearm. They said that they was called to the airport. So there's two conflicting stories with mm. this. But however, even if they call you to the airport or if you followed him to the airport, the question becomes, there, the, let me tell you what the charge is. The charge is uh, alleged illegal possession of a firearm. So if you was called to the airport or you followed and you say that this person is not supposed to have this firearm, why not apprehend him at the airport? Either way, whatever story you're telling, either way, why did you not apprehend him at the airport? Why go to a judge to get a court order to kick in his door with a, a warrant that has to be executed between December the 7th and December the 18th and you executed it on the 12th? Why wait for three weeks when you could have apprehended him at the airport? And the mm -hmm. reason mm -hmm. why is because of this whole BIE, Black Identity Extremist Classification. Mm -hmm. They wanted to build up a case to get him out of his community. They wanted to build up a case to get him out of the programs that he's developing. They wanted to get him out of the community so that he could not be an example of what the black man should be. They wanted to disarm him so he could not defend African people. So right. they executed this warrant three weeks later so they can seize all of his properties and to build a case against him. Now, in my opinion, and I say it with strong conviction, no doubt at all, that not only the agent who uh, was responsible for leading up the task, but all the other law enforcement agents with this BIE uh, classification, just like COINTELPRO, they don't like what they see. They don't like organizing. They want us to shut the hell up. They want us to be quiet. They don't want to see African progress at its finest organized and moving and creating and building. And in addition to that, there was a sour, sour, sour taste left in their minds and imprinted on their brains about the Dallas 2016 uh, shootings that has them so heated. And I really feel as though we got to pin it on somebody alive. We got to do this. We got to do that. Somebody got to take the fall. We got to teach these folks a lesson. They just can't be walking around here doing X, Y, and Z. Because why would you follow a man for two years and four months who has not committed any crimes in the time frame that you have followed him? When is it? A, when do you back off? Exactly. They never would. They would never back off because they see the programs that are being instituted by Guerrilla Mainframe and Geronimo Tactical. Rakim Balagoon is very efficient and very reliable when it comes to training children, men and women, how to properly use firearms, how to defend themselves, how to fight off an attacker how to eat properly, how to develop the, your best capacity when it comes to physical training. He was the best out of all of us. I'm at the bottom of that totem pole, but in everybody else, he was a top dog 
when it comes to those very things. And this was the very thing that they did not want to see. Can you imagine Rakim creating 100, 200, 500 more Rakims? We can imagine mm, it. They, were they can imagine happen. it. And they did not want that to happen. So with this charge, which is illegal possession of a firearm, allegedly, um, the, the public defender at the time said, well, this charge is being brought about because of a, a, a misdemeanor that took place in 2007, 10 years ago. So uh, it really has no bearing on uh, this man. But what happens is the U.S. government, they have, they're so slick. They're so brilliant when it comes to their laws. They have a law in place that allows you to move freely after you done did your time, but then that federal law will come and override that. If you, under the federal law, you can actually have a firearm for self-defense in your home and even outside of that. But if any time, it could be 10, 15, 40 years from now, under the federal law, if they find reason that you should not have it, they can ride with that and say you are in violation anytime that they feel like it mm. anytime that they feel like it so the the way that the laws is set up is set up for failure and if he is convicted of this crime that would make him a felon he's not this was a misdemeanor charge but that would make him a felon which will absolutely have him pulled out of his community pulled out from everything he cannot be around any type of firearms he will be totally disarmed and that's exactly what the whole point is to do to do that so they spent two and a half years to do that and that's what we pretty much are oh says that 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 was a lot, sis. Just, um, I'm just sitting here, just internalizing everything that you just, um, everything that you just, just and um, I want to know, sis. How can we? What, do, what does the family need sis, at this point? Where, where can we? Because we, we looked on. Uh, there was a video circulating on social media. I can show it to you. I don't know who put it together. But this is the video. Can you see my? Can you see my screen? Yes, I see it. Okay, so this yes. video, this video was circulating. There was a sister. Oh man, I don't know why my screen is freezing right now. What was going on? But there was this video that was uh, circulating. Our sister named Tiffany. Are you familiar with this sister? Yes, ma'am. Okay, she po she posted this video, and um, I looked at the video, and I was going to start circulating it myself. Until I tried to get on the GoFundMe, try to access the GoFundMe page, and it just it wouldn't it wouldn't access. It, it just it said that no campaign exists. So I didn't want to circulate the incorrect information. So how can people uh, donate and get the money directly to him? So people want to donate to his lawyer. So if you have like maybe the lawyers, because I know some people, and I just got to be honest with you, sis. Some people are really skeptical with all of the fraud, the fraudulent activity going on. A lot of people are skeptical, skeptical, skeptical about uh, sending money to PayPal and GoFundMe and all of that. His lawyer, do you guys, did you guys secure a lawyer for him? Because if you did, he can make payments directly to his lawyer. Um, if um, his uh, bah, 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 his commissary, I know when you're in the federal institution, because I was in one for 12 months. <laughs> When you're in a federal institution, you get your money right away. You can send it online and hit your account right away. So if people could have like the name, his inmate number, his facility, and how to send the money directly to him so that he gets that. Do you guys have that information? Yes, ma'am, we absolutely do. I'm actually uh, in the Google Hangout with you, and uh, I'm trying to find a way to send you the uh, updated and current uh, flyer. Everything uh, on there is correct except for the GoFundMe. Uh, the, Go the GoFundMe is not in existence. 
um, we do have both those other two. And then there's also um, one called Venmo. Venmo is um, V-E-N-M-O. You can donate through Venmo and it's GMF214. Just like the uh, Cash App. The Cash App has a dollar sign in front of it. And the PayPal me is slash GMF214. But they all have GMF214 and then a dollar sign. So I do apologize about uh, uh, you not having this. I would like to send it to you if I uh, knew how to send it in the Google Hangout. Send it right to you can send it right to my Facebook and I'll post it. So there's a flyer that's created. Oh, I, I think I found the way to do it. Let me see. Yeah, I think I got it. Um, and uh, also, uh, you was asking about uh, legal defense. I would like to talk to you about that, if that's okay. Yes, yes, ma'am. Please do. Okay, let's see here. Okay, so as here, I'm sending this right now. Let me know if you got it in the uh, Google Hangout. Hopefully, you got you see that there. My screen froze on me, sis. Oh, okay. so I. Yeah, I don't even know what's going on. I know when I talk, you'll probably see this little flyer up. Um, okay. Well, yeah, I did I did successfully put it in the Google Hangout. Maybe someone else will be able to let you know if it's there. But uh, later, uh, once I get off with you, I would love to go and put, put it on your Facebook page. I just don't want to um, do too much multitasking because I don't want to hang up with you. <laughs> I don't want to lose you. Yeah, yes, ma'am. Uh, <laughs> uh, Tell us about his attorney. Okay, yeah, so the situation with the attorney, um, uh, uh, Christopher Daniels, he was a working man. Like I said, they follow him to work every day, every single day. And uh, he had a newborn daughter, and he also have an adopted son, and he have another son, so he has uh, three children. And um, by him being a working father, you know, his role was to support his family. Well, with him being gone, um we're also raising funds to support his family as well and him being inside of there he currently has a public defender we actually went through the process and are still going through the process of finding him a, a legal representative the one that we truly wanted she was really uh, uh excited about taking the case and she actually quoted a surprise that was half the cost that she normally charges. But that half a cost was still much more than we could afford. So um, we're still in the stages of finding uh, an attorney for him. But one of the things that um, about this man is that this man is a true soldier and his family comes first. And he told us, he say, I don't want y'all to be burdening burden with finding legal representation do what you can do but um, please help look after my family so we're faced with those two things but we are definitely still searching for legal defense at this time and uh the numbers as far as the numbers uh so far we're like needing about like fifteen thousand uh to get a lawyer he goes to trial on march 26 here in um, Dallas. That's his trial date. And so we have that time frame to find a lawyer. Like, it's people out there that want to represent him, but it's just a matter of the financial cost of weighing who we would have to do that. So um, we're also encouraging uh, people who do know people that can legally take the case to even if they were to do it pro bono. But you know, a lot of times when you do things pro bono, you don't really get that full intent of getting that justice that's needed. You know what I mean? Hello, you there with me? Sis, are you still there? You still there? Yeah, did I lose you? Uh, yeah, I, don't know. I, I just logged in on my phone. Yes, I was gone. I don't know what happened with my computer. Um, it says that we're still live. Um, oh, I, didn't, but, I was I was talking quite a bit. I don't know if your audience heard, 
But oh, I they, they heard. Oh, look, look, okay. look, they, they heard that I, but I didn't. Um, <laughs> goodness, can you can you says can you go to YouTube and see if we're still live? Because my computer like completely froze on me, and it says that we're live. It, yeah, it says that we're on live on the Hangout. Yeah, but what about YouTube on actual the YouTube site? Right. I'm wondering if we're still live. Uh, let me ask one of my comrades because I know that they were. Uh, looking in um i see new black has his mic muted a new black new black order are we still live on youtube brother i don't know sis but keep on talking it is it is what it is so you guys were trying to get uh so he has a public uh defender yeah. you so said there was, was a woman that was very, very yeah what mm -hmm. i was telling your audience just a second ago um was that we we have a public defender now um we had a, a lawyer that wanted to take the case even though she cut the cost in half it was still more than we could afford so we're still looking to raise funds for legal defense his trial comes up on march the 26th and um, there are people who are interested in taking the case and we do have a list to choose from however it's still a question of funds and money so um we're hoping to question have you guys reached out, to malik? reached out to malik have you guys reached out to malik malik sulu shabazz uh no we haven't reached out to him no ma'am yeah i think that malik sulu shabazz would be very interested in taking the case and would do it for a reasonable amount of money yeah we've had we have like a list of, of people and he is on the list you know, so it's just a matter of um, where we at now is um, trying to get some funds to get that process started and then choosing from uh, the ones that we think are the um, most reliable. Because a lot of times when it comes to uh, monies, you know, it's, you don't want to ask nobody to do anything for free sometimes because, you know, you kind of get a half ass job. So, you know. Oh, yeah. No, no, no. Expect for anybody to do this pro bono. But, uh, you know, yeah. But what I suggest is, and it's just, this is just my experience with trying to raise funds. I would suggest, you know, the organization or his family picking a lawyer and securing the lawyer, you know, and, and saying, okay, we have such and such, such and such representing, you know, brother uh, Rakim. And um, this is what the, the lawyer is going to cover.